Please welcome Katie Thompson, Deputy Executive Editor, Business Insider. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Katie Thompson. I am the Deputy Executive Editor at Business Insider, and we want to thank all of you for joining us this morning, and we want to give a special thanks to Visa for helping make this event possible. This is Business Insider's 10th year of doing Ignition, and as part of that anniversary, we've been hosting special events around the country in different cities focused on specific industries. And today, we're here to talk about the retail industry. I don't have to tell you guys that the retail industry is going through massive changes. Last year alone, we saw more than 9,000 store closings, and we've seen retailers from Forever 21 to luxury retailers like Barney's filing for bankruptcy. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are a number of companies, new products, new business models bucking the retail apocalypse. And today, we're excited to have some of the leaders who are leading that charge to tell us how they're doing it. We really want you guys to ask questions, and at the end of each session, we'll have a few minutes to get to those questions, but we do encourage you to hold those questions to the end. Uh, and we also want you to engage on social media. If you would like to do that, please use the hashtag Retail Ignition. So with that, let's get started. Please welcome Jeff Ramsey, co-founder and chief evangelist, eMarketer. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Wow, I can hear me. Wow, that's a little too loud. Okay. Um, so, I only have 20 minutes. This is a warning. I'm going to uh, be going through some, uh, I think it's like 45 slides in 20 minutes with about 468 builds, 200 sources. Um, so, what I would suggest you do is fasten your seatbelts. Don't even try to take notes. If you think you can take pictures, go ahead and try, but you will never be able to keep up with it. It's humanly impossible. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, simply give me or one of my colleagues a business card. It's called a form of opt-in. CCPA. Okay, so what are the uh, six trends that we need to be aware of uh, and what we're going to cover in the next 20 minutes? Uh, they go as follows. We're going to take a very quick top line look at what, what's happening with e-commerce growth. Yes, it is growing. Mobile shopping and buying. And by the way, just as this is a real story, I left my phone in the car today and I feel naked. So if I look a little weird or uncomfortable, that's, that's why. We're going to talk about social commerce. Is it finally taking off? Frictionless commerce. This is a very exciting topic for me because it's just getting faster, better, easier. Digital ad spending by the retail industry. Is the retail industry keeping up with digital ad spending? Uh, and then mobile proximity payments. We're only going to be able to just kind of touch the surface on each one of these things. And let's start with the top line of e-commerce growth. We get right into it. And what we find is, yeah, it's a big thing. Uh, E-commerce topped $666 billion. Uh, according to eMarketer, this is what our, our uh, forecasters look at all of these numbers all day long and try to triage from all the thousands of different sources. And this is what we've come up uh, with. And that equates to, that $666 billion equates to one out of every $12 spent on retail. And the growth rate this year, we're predicting 12.8%, just to kind of put an a, 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 a emphasis on it. And that is versus 2% growth rate for total retail sales. That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody in this room. When we look at the net centricity factor, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about the percent of total retail sales that are done uh, via e-commerce. We find that, surprise, Books, music, and video is number one. Amazon, of course, led the charge way back in what was it, 1999 with books, and it's just taken off since there. Almost half of books, uh, music, and video are done online. That's followed by cons uh, computer and consumer electronics, which makes sense. Technology folks tend to be more digital. And then finally, we have uh, toys and hobbies, and about 32% of those sales are done online. So categories do make a difference. So. Big, big surprise here. Amazon is a very, very big player in this. $257 billion out of 666. Do the math. That's uh, four out of $10 go to Amazon, e-commerce dollars. And if we look at the entire $5.6 trillion that are spent in retail, Amazon comes at just under 5% at 4.6% of all retail sales. So truly, they are the 800-pound gorilla uh, in the space. And just to show you how big 
eBay's next at 5.7%, and then Walmart uh, at 4.8% of e-commerce sales. Even though they are obviously spending a huge amount of money in the e-commerce space, they still have a long way to go. Amazon is still crushing it with 18% growth this year versus that 12.8% growth for overall e-commerce, which we saw before. Now we move to mobile shopping and buying trends, and I'm frustrated because I don't have my mobile phone today, so I can't do any shopping or buying, and I'm feeling really agitated. But what we see is that there's 167 million people in America who are buying stuff on their phones. That's 84% of all digital buyers. Um, let's look at the numbers. Mobile is by far the fastest growing uh, retail e-commerce channel. This is the holiday uh, 2019 sales uh, growth by channel. Brick and mortar comes in at 2.5%, uh, desktop, laptop, 4.3%. Mobile killing it at 25% growth, um, which again shouldn't be a surprise. What that means is, is that mobile, um, it, somewhere between 2020 and 2021, will eclipse desktop, laps, laptop, in terms of uh, e-commerce sales, it will be roughly half or more of all e-commerce sales, uh, somewhere in that range, and 60% of e-commerce sales by 2023. So those phones are, are really active uh, buying machines. And mobile influence is also a tremendous amount of sales offline as well, and there's all kinds of numbers that support that. Now we get to social commerce. Everybody's been talking about it. Are people actually buying stuff on Facebook and, and uh, Pinterest and, and YouTube and so on. And the answer is, well, kind of, sort of. Uh, well, this looks at the share of referral traffic to e-commerce sites coming from social. And we see that it went from about 3.1% in 2016 to uh, 2019. It topped in at about 9.1%, at least according to Adobe. Uh, so uh, social share of uh, referral traffic is going up, and we find that social is by far the fastest growing referral source for offline, uh, for, sorry, for online retailers. It's up something like 110% uh, versus last year. Direct purchasing on social media sites is also growing. It tends to impact mostly at the mid-funnel range, uh, and this is looking at U.S. Internet users who purchase directly uh, on social media sites, and we see a, a pretty significant rise from about 13% to 21% over a pretty short period of time, or one in five adult Internet users making purchases directly on social media. Even if they're not making a lot of them, they are doing it at some rate. It's not a routine buying behavior just yet. Uh, Pinterest and Instagram uh, checkout are leading the way. Pinterest really, really got this started. Um, look, it's more Midwestern, middle-aged uh, uh, women, but man, it is a, a buying uh, platform if there ever was one. Uh, all the data suggests that, you know, even though it's somewhat niche, a lot of sales go through uh, Pinterest. But you got to watch out for Instagram checkout. Of course, Facebook's always trying to mimic the, the, the whatever is successful out there. And now you can uh, look at a photograph of a particular blouse you like and go and buy it with uh, Instagram checkout. Then we get to the, one of my favorite topics, which is frictionless commerce. And I can tell you that I have been an e-marketer analyst uh, in my previous days when we started e-marketer back in 1998. And I remember writing the first report, and the biggest concept that was, was kind of staring me in the face is that the Internet is all about removing friction. If you haven't gotten that yet, um, please, please think about it carefully. Way back in 1999, they patented the one click. I mean... How brilliant was that? It, they took all of the energy that you had to go through, all of this process of buying online, and just said, with one click, once you uh, registered, you can buy anything you want. And that was back in 1999. And it's still about reducing friction. So then we get to what's the time it takes to go from I click on a website to actually having uh, the package delivered at my doorstep. In fact, this looks like my doorstep every single day. Sometimes there's double that amount. I have uh, four kids uh, uh, that are in various parts of the uh, world, and they just have stuff come there, and then they pick it up when they come home. Uh, I have a Prime membership, and they all steal that, so I get all these notifications about stuff arriving. It's never for me. It's always for somebody else, but that's my own problem. I won't get into that. But here's, here's interesting data. Looking at the click-to-door speed, the, the time it takes between you click on a, a website and you actually get it delivered, and you look at Amazon in the red, and you see that they've decreased it from 4.2 days down to 2.5 days on average, right? 
That's pretty significant. And uh, the regular, uh, every, all, every other retailer uh, went from 7.8 days in the same time frame from 2016 uh, to now, and, and they're down to 5.3. That still means that Amazon has almost a three-day uh, gap ahead, right? So there's a lot of work to do to kind of close that gap with the other retailers, Walmart and so on. And with the expansion of Next Day Prime and competition from Walmart and Target, expect this trend to continue of shrinking that time before you click and you get it at your doorstep. And in fact, between November of 2017 and August of 2019, the share of packages for which one-day shipping was available increased from 12.4% to well over a third. And just to put another point on it, and it's all because of Amazon Prime, uh, they are planning at Amazon to take one-day shipping from 10 million items today that are available, one-day shipping, to 100 million over the next few years. So, yeah. And consumers have been trained to expect faster and faster delivery speeds. Let's take a look at it. Uh, this is percent of shoppers who are either extremely or very interested in next day shipping. In 2013, 43% said, yep. And that went to a majority at 64% uh, last year, and it just continues to go up. It just becomes the norm. And if you're a millennial, it's kind of like, we don't need data. What? A few days? I want it now. This is why we're going to have drone deliveries uh, very soon. Frictionless commerce, of course, is also coming to brick and mortar stores. Um, if you look at these are recent numbers from eMarketer, we've had uh, click and collect where you click on a website and then you go pick it up at the store. I needed to get uh, the latest AirPods from my wife uh, for Christmas. They weren't able to be delivered in time, so I had to click and then go to an actual physical store, which I haven't been in in like five years. And I went in and I picked it up. So this is a phenomenon, and about 138 million people are doing this today. That is two thirds of digital buyers, or 50% of the population, are doing the click to buy. Uh, uh, scenario. Moving right along, if we look at click and collect share of online sales uh, for leading multi-channel retailers, and you see a steady uh, increase from 19% in 2017 to about 22.5%. Steady increase. We'll just expect to see that growing over the next few years. And of course, Amazon then took frictionless into the, the physical store at, in a new way with uh, Amazon Go, where you just walk in with your phone and you can go in, pick your uh, merchandise up. You're never going through a cashier. You're just simply walking in and walking out. It's really kind of a cool concept if you haven't seen it. The global forecast, this is from Business Insider, which we eMarketer just merged with, by the way. Uh, the global forecast is for 10,000 autonomous checkout stores uh, to roll out within the next five years, so from 350 to uh, 10,000 in a very short period of time. That's pretty fast growth. But to put that into perspective, while the growth rate is really torrid in terms of uh, cashierless stores, what we've uh, seen, and this is again from Business Insider, global payments volume at stores with a autonomous checkout is $21 billion. And that sounds like a lot, but if you hold that up against just US retail uh, stores, which is 5.6 trillion, you see that it's a drop in the bucket. So we still have a very long way to go. What are the top two concerns? Why are people like reluctant to do this? One is they're, they, they're worried about being charged for items that uh, they didn't want, right? Uh, wait, what is this? I didn't buy that. How come I'm getting charged for it? And then, of course, right up next to that is security. Ooh, Amazon will have more information about me. The joke is, when, as I said, when we have like 15 boxes all coming from Amazon at our house every day, my wife is a little concerned about you know, the Alexa device listening into our conversations and things like this. And I'm like, do you know how much information Amazon already has on us? They know what kind of toilet paper we use. They know what kind of underwear we have. I mean. It, it, I don't think they, there's any more information that they need, but they're, they're getting it. And then you've got voice-activated devices. Anybody have an Alexa or Google Home at home? Okay. Uh, and, and anybody who has a phone is basically uh, uh, using voice-activated too. Why? It's about reducing friction. I don't have to go to a phone or a laptop and sit there and text and type. I can simply use my voice and stuff happens. So once again, it's about frictionless commerce. The, Increase in people who have voice-activated devices is just, is just exponential. At this point, or, or actually in 2019, 
It's 23.5%, uh, and by the end of this year, it'll be 25% of all of us, not just internet users, all of us in America will have one of these devices sitting in our uh, living rooms or our kitchens or all of our rooms. So that's 24% roughly in 2019. If you look at millennials, that number goes up to almost 40%. So if you're trying to reach younger people, better get on those machines uh, pretty darn quick. 40% of smart uh, speaker owners have used them for shopping, right? The number one thing is audio, Spotify, Pandora, podcasts, et cetera. But look at inquirers at 73%. This is search activity, guys. Um, so be aware that 73% are using it to search without going to uh, any kind of uh, device where they have to type. And typically they get one answer, right? There's no blue lines and you click which link. There's no link to click. It's just you'll tend to get one answer, so you have to watch out for that. Uh, and yet for most retailers, voice-enabled search remains a low-level priority uh, for investment. So I think we need to kind of rectify that because there's a gap there between what consumers are doing and how retailers are picking up on it. Um, digital ad spending by the retail industry. Uh, the good news is that they're actually keeping up. Uh, $33 billion was spent on digital uh, advertising uh, by retailers, uh, or will be spent uh, by the end of this year. That's at a 16.9% growth rate, which happens to be right in line with the increase in digital ad spending overall. So retail is right on the target at, at six, almost 17% growth. Uh, retailers are spending their digital ad dollars in three critical areas, and they are as follows in no particular order. Mobile, search, and you guessed it, Amazon, and we'll take a closer look at each one of those. In terms of mobile, uh, we're estimating uh, by the end of this year, uh, $24 billion will be spent by retailers on mobile advertising. Uh, that will account for 71% of their entire digital ad spend. So forget the desktop, laptop area. It really, the story really is in mobile as it is with others. Uh, this is from AMP. Our retail cl uh, uh, clients are very active in mobile. Why? It's all about bridging the offline and online world. The question is, can I leverage mobile to either push brick and mortar or pull p people into the e-commerce funnel? It is inextricably linked. It's pulling together the offline and the online world. Then we get to search uh, spending, which uh, we're estimating uh, by uh, retailers will be about 16 billion this year with a 19% growth rate. Uh, Amazon is driving a lot of that. What that means is that search is roughly 47% of what uh, uh, retailers are spending uh, on terms of their digital dollars versus 43% for all advertisers. So they're much more heavily skewed towards search, which kind of makes sense for e-commerce. And while Google, still gets most of the search dollars. We see they have 73% of search ad revenues in the US in 2019. Let's look at where things go in just the next few years in 2021. Google actually starts to lose some share of search ad dollars, and Amazon picks up three percentage points to almost 16% of search dollars uh, by 2021. So that's the big story there, uh, once again, with Amazon. And when you think about it, this is our analyst, Nicole Perrin, who says, visitors to Amazon are already in a shopping mode. And they're not just receptive to product messaging, they're actively looking for it, and that is the key. And if we take a closer look at it, Amazon is now the preferred search engine if you are looking to buy a product, all right? The data is all over the place from tons of different sources. Amazon is where 66% of US digital shoppers start searching for products online, right? Here's another one uh, from another source. 49% of digital stoppers start their product searches on Amazon, while only 22% start on Google. Uh, some CPGs, consumer packaged goods firms, are moving 50 to 60% of their Google search budgets to Amazon. This is happening now. This is not an actual quote from Jeff Bezos, but I'm sure he's thinking that. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Actually, I do. This is the final trend, which is mobile proximity payments. Does anybody use mo mobile proximity payments, You're, even if you know what it is, where you use your phone to pay in a store? It's a thing, right? So let's take a look at that. These are our latest numbers. One third of smartphone users in the US today use proximity uh, mobile payments today. And we expect that to grow to 33.6%. So even by 2023, two thirds of smartphone owners won't be using 
uh, mobile proximity payments in 2023. It's kind of a niche thing for about a third of us. Those of us who love it, we do it at Dunkin' Donuts, we do it at Starbucks, we do it everywhere we go, and the rest of the two-thirds of us, um, no, not so interested. No surprise, younger folks are more inclined. This is percent of smartphone owners using mobile proximity payments by age, and big surprise, among millennials, 18 to 34, significantly higher uh, penetration with mobile proximity payments. Interest in using a mobile wallet tends to be mixed. Uh, this is from Vibes. 28% uh, said, yes, I use a mobile wallet, which is pretty close to our one-third number that we had, right? And uh, uh, number uh, two here is no, but I would like to, so they're thinking about it. But the big one is no, and I'm not interested, thank you very much. I have my credit cards, I have my debit cards, I, I really don't see the need to use these things. So that's what's holding it back in the US. The key factor, what the US smartphone owners see as the number one barrier to using a, a mobile wallet, it comes back to the, the age old thing of security, which is why, why people back in 1998 didn't want to buy online in the first place because they were worried about security. But guess what, they got over it, and I think they'll eventually get over this, so we'll, we'll see that. Security concerns, though, are absolutely a problem uh, excuse me, with the adoption of proximity, mobile proximity payments for both perception and reality, there are no shortage of examples of privacy breaches. We've seen them with Target and Experian and all kinds of others. So yes, there's a, there's a genuine need for having a little bit of concern there. When it comes to the uh, uh, proximity mobile payment users in the US, Apple Pay is way ahead of the pack in the red. We estimate uh, at eMarketer that there's about 30 million people using uh, Apple Pay today. I'm one of them, except not today because I left my phone in the car, as I said. Starbucks, number two. I mean, they, they're just basically selling coffee, but they're number two at 25 million. Uh, Google Pay, way, way behind at 12 million, so they have a ways to go to catch up. Uh, Apple Pay users, we estimate, are almost half of all, all uh, proximity payment users. Remember, this is not mutually exclusive. People who use these things tend to have three or four different forms of mobile payment on them at any given time. In contrast to the tepid growth in users, the value of transactions made with mobile proximity payments is growing rapidly. $98 billion, or almost $100 billion in 2019, and we see what, uh, I'm a Canadian, so we like to look at hockey stick growth, $220 billion, that's a 2.2x growth rate over the next few years, growing very fast. Two factors are driving that growth, very briefly, it's the average annual spending is growing from about $1,500 to about $2,100, so we're spending more, right, on an annual basis, and users are making more frequent payments um, in fact, significantly, uh, we're seeing uh, the growth rate of, the, it's not just a novelty anymore, it's much, much more frequent on a monthly basis. As a result, consumer adoption, retail, retailers are slowly getting on board. 74 out of the top 100 retailer chains said that they uh, accepted Apple Pay as of Jan 2019, and that's just going to keep growing up. And yet, only 42% of small businesses have accepted digital wallets uh, versus 90% uh, for credit cards and 84% debit uh, cards. Who, who doesn't take a credit card today? I don't know, but that's, that's the case. With that, I think I've just now gone five seconds over my time limit. I want to thank you. If you would like a copy of this presentation, we'll be happy to send it to you. This is only 0.00347% of all the information we have on these subjects. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Please welcome Maggie Winter, CEO and co-founder, AIR. John Targan, founder and design director, Fall Risk, and Leandro Medine, founder, Man Repeller. for having me. Um, I'm going to be moderating a conversation with you two about being cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not, it's a tough crowd. <laughs> it's a bad joke. It's unclear. I like it. <laughs> anyway, Maggie is, as was just mentioned, the CEO and co-founder of AIR, which has been in existence for five years. And John is the founder of Fall Risk, which is about nine months old, so not yeah. even one year. You, you've just had a baby. I've had a baby. Is what's yeah. happened. So jealous. The first uh, man to have a baby, yeah. Very impressively, 
actually both companies are profitable, which is very cool in a landscape that has prioritized and favored the cool factor over profitability, and both of you seem to retain both properties, which is very compelling. So I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into that, but let's first start with your experience. Maggie, you really started your career at J. Crew, and particularly were there during like a golden era of you know, Michelle Obama days and yes. times. I was there from 2005 till the end of 2012, and to your point, it was when uh, the Obama girls wore crew cuts to the inauguration and Oprah named the ballet flat as one of her favorite things and Jenna Lyons became a bold-faced name and it was such an exciting time of brand building and great design and great merchandising. Um, while I was there, the company launched Madewell, which is where I met one of my co-founders, Jack Cameron, who was uh, Madewell's first denim designer. And it was a really, really exciting time to learn from leaders of the industry. And um, J. Crew was doing such a good job of democratizing uh, high quality raw goods, working with Laura Piana and um, Harris Tweed and telling mill stories, Baron McNutt Irish linen. and. Um, they were really making uh, high quality, thoughtful design accessible to a mass audience without commoditizing it. And it was an awesome seven or eight years to learn from industry leaders. And what made you want to start AIR? Uh, as big and as successful as J.Crew was, there were things that um, the company uh, wasn't focused on that as um, a person in my, at the time in my late 20s felt um, like uh, no-brainers. If you know, Digital commerce being mm -hmm. one, digital connection and community being another, and, uh, and just sort of the idea of connecting, having, um, having a sustained direct connection with your audience when it comes to every touch point, whether it's how clothing is photographed, designed, or discussed, and um, that was something that really resonated with Jack and with me, and um, and uh, and also the idea of simplifying everything. 2012, when we first started working on air, was kind of like the peak of the zarification of the retail universe, and you had everything instantly accessible, so cheap, so fast, so immediate. But it felt like um, amidst all that choice and noise, there was an absence of clear, consistent quality, and that there was an opportunity to kind of cut through the bullshit and offer um, really thoughtfully designed products that could be uh, available to um, a lot of different types of women that didn't rely really heavily on labels and logos, mm -hmm. but um, that it was about simplifying everything and bringing good design to everybody. and. Um, and taking sort of a seasonless, timeless, ageless, more classic approach to what we knew works year after year. And I'm, five years ago, you were definitely a leader in that space, but it's become a fairly, I don't want to say commonplace, but par for the course for brands to rely heavily and emphasize the quality of their product and to have it be a little bit quieter. So we can talk about that a little bit later. But John, you have a pretty elaborate history of working at luxury houses, Celine, Prada, Marc Jacobs, Burberry? Yes. Burberry. Yeah. And this is the second brand you've launched. Correct. The first was Baja East. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about why Fall Risk. Uh, you know, I think first and foremost, I'm obsessed with brand. Um, you know, uh, my, my biggest MO was to... What does that mean, though, obsessed oh, with okay. brand? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll tell you what that means for me. So it's, you know, I'm obsessed with how a brand interacts and like what that touch point feels and looks like across like all their forms of communication. So I'm obsessed with, because I think a lot of marketing is BS, so I think it's how do you, no matter what the product is, like even at these luxury houses, like you peel back some of the labor, la like some of the like layers, and you know, bags are actually coming from China and, ma and you know, made in Italy, stamps are happening in Italy after the final stitching is constructed. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's marketing. Brand for me is tied into marketing and how you communicate the message you want people to see. Um, and my, my kind of MO was I was in this rat race of doing shows, creating you know, 80 looks to ultimately narrow it down to what my actual customer wanted to buy or what stores wanted to buy. And I was just kind of over that. I wanted to deliver and you know, first off, I wanted to design product that I was obsessed with. 
and that could just be one single item. And I wanted it to be limited, and I wanted to create a whole new narrative, which was not about, I didn't need to show you a world of, um, you know, 80 looks down a runway to have you feel and understand what my brand is. So was did, that, did you ask what compelled me to start? <laughs> well, <laughs> was that, partially, was yeah. that sensibility or that understanding contingent on what you saw happening in the culture? Or just the way that you were interacting and engaging with other brands? Yes, what, what, what I also, it, one part that, right, which is, which is my spectrum of how I consume also shifted. So, uh -huh. so I, was, I wasn't just interested in luxury brands. I wasn't just interested in certain things. I became more kind of niche by product myself. And then the second part was I definitely saw the way people were looking at products. Like, you know, where is it made? Is it sustainable? What goes into it? Who's making it? And, and those things started to drive me to where this idea around specific craftsmanship became my key focus. So uh -huh. it was, how can I make the best product at what I still think is a, which was a new price point for me with Falrus, but how can I make the best product that is overall sourced, sustained, manufactured in the most, you know, in what I consider and determine the most ethical ways alongside a lot of other kind of metrics that monitor this kind of thing. And how can I deliver that in a way that is fresh and new? So this, I want to talk a little bit also about this impact, this um, shift towards sustainability and the way in which all brands are talking about sustainability because it, it seems like such a hot box and this sort of relates to my next question, which is contingent, it's, uh, who is your target customer and how are you engaging with them? It sounds like the conversation on uh, sustainability and how you are scratching that itch for them and making them feel like conscious consumers is pretty significant and like a, a necessary part of that conversation. So first question, how do you define sustainability within the guardrails and parameters of like building a business that is actually profitable? And uh, who is this target customer and how are you talking to them about it and other stuff? You touched on it already, which I, th I think sustainability actually has a much broader application than we conventionally use it for. We use it to talk about environmental impact, which is Im hugely important, but it's, uh, sustainability also speaks, maybe it's less sexy, but speaks to your business model and mm -hmm. your ability to last a long time. Um, I mean, Jeff was just starting about talking about a company he founded that's 24 years old. 24 years old is a big part of your adult life. You start families, you, you know, like life happens. That's not a quick turnaround. And I think that right now there's such a trend in our industry and in retail to, um, with all, you know, the cult of entrepreneurship and, and how attractive startups sound. Um, that it's all about growing quickly or scaling fast and really it's about resilience and maintaining um, a, a long-term consistent connection with a customer. We talk about like connectivity and community and this cult idea, you said the cult of brand. Ultimately brand is about consistency. It's about delivering uh, and maintaining a consistent relationship with pops of surprise and imagination throughout to keep you interested. It's a relationship, it's a long ongoing thing. And so um, when we think about sustainability, we of course think about water consumption in the denim that we're making in LA. We also talk about um, the uh, integrity and ownership of the mills that we work with. We love working with third generation, family owned businesses. Um, and we also talk a ton about how do we ensure that our company and our brand exists for our customers five years from now in a way that is going to continue to resonate for them. And to have that kind of consistency and continuity, you have to have a business that runs on its own margins mm -hmm. and that thinks centrally about serving the customer and creating value in her life first. And, and so sustainability is not just about um, you know, our, our water consumption or cutting down dependence on chemicals in our factories. It's also about making sure that air lives all year round for many years um, from a business standpoint. Fall 2020 is sustainable, but the model is not. Exactly. It doesn't matter if you're not, yeah, exactly, if you're not around five years later. Right. Okay, can you repeat for one sec the question? <laughs> What is sustainability oh. for you, and who is your target customer, and how are you engaging with them? Okay, sustainability, I, so I, it's a three -pronged. I, I align uh, similarly over there as uh -huh. well. 
I would say sustainability is for me specifically. Uh, you know, I, I have started off with a, a niche which is knitwear, and so I can control my waste. You know, I do a, a lot of 3D manufacturing. Um, also, I can get right into biodegradable yarns. Um, you know, proper dyes, plant dyes. You know, things that aren't toxic for our planet. So that one part within itself for me was a was a focus from the get go. And then I think about you know. I very much within my personal life and my business life, I mirror my same patterns with both. So, you know, I have no plastic in my office, I have no plastic in my home. I, you know, I have compostable shipping bags, I've eliminated tissue paper. You know, all of these things I, I actually think that I have to personally live in my life. Mm -hmm. And because I think my, when you asked about the target co consumer, you know, I set out to market to and sell to what I thought was, let's go with 35 to 65 you know, with a certain amount of spend, similar to where I had been before in my career with my customers. And what happened within my, after my first volume dropped was, I had this shining bright light of to Gen To be clear, Z. you refer to collections as volumes? I do, yes, okay. yeah, I do. Um, and because volumes are all, uh -huh. they're, they're chapters to me ultimately, right? So I'm writing this novel, and what you're going to see from me from one volume to the next actually works back to what came before, but I can also interject whatever I wish. It's really essentially, my own personal freedom as a designer and as a businessman to not think, and, and also to, to say to somebody, you are building a wardrobe, right? And whatever you buy from others or whatever you already own, it should all speak back to what came before from me personally. Mm -hmm. I don't want you buying you know, a knit dress that you're like, oh, that was just of the moment and it's gone, right? So back to my consumer part really quick was, I set out to market to this luxury segment and I was like, oh, okay, that's what I know, that's who I'm gonna hit. And after my first volume dropped, I, um, I had this like shining quick data, which was I was hitting 17 to around 30 as like 80, over 80% 80 of my base. Second time, I hit again. So I had this, you know, and I think it's because also mentally, you know, I'm 37, but maybe I operate in the mindset of a Gen Z uh, person, which I don't know what that says about my adulthood, but, um, but it is something that, I had this audience shining out to me, mm -hmm. and that's where I was like, I have to listen to what my data is showing, what this base is, and now, who am I marketing? I'm after Gen Z, mm -hmm. or I wanna keep this dialogue open, because that's happening naturally and organically for my business, and then, okay, I can go after these other people or whatnot, but, but Gen Z began to be the immediate demographic that was consuming my brand. How important has the concept of community been? You know, re really uh, identifying your customer as a community that you're building and cultivating. Uh, well, you said something interesting earlier that made me think about the sustainability thing relates to community too, is that you were talking about how you used to work on creating 80 looks and um, the amount of sampling and development that goes into creating, editing down to mm -hmm. 80 looks is massive. It's probably yeah. more than like either of our brands should produce in three years total. Mm -hmm. And that used to happen like four times a year, six times a year. And the idea is now we've got this completely fractured retail landscape where instead of a few big resources that make everything for everybody, you have many resources that make a few things for a specific um, uh, customer in mind. And I love that you have such a broad age range that you thought of intentionally. We have. Similarly, you'll see in our marketing, my co-founder Max's granny is one of our most popular models. She's <laughs> appeared on Mare Repeller. And Several times. In, in <laughs> Italian Vogue, and she's super fabulous. But um, the thing that is so cool is that we align on like a series of values, like you were describing, and we're uncompromising on some of those. Quality is one that limits us on price point, so we're not going to be the most democratically priced denim brand on the market, but we can deliver made in LA jeans at a very um, fair price for how high the quality is and they last season after season. And so we find ourselves, instead of aligning on exclusivity, instead of aligning on offering the lowest price, we really um, rely on brand, which mm -hmm. is, is value. That's what, when you per purchase something, you're indicating that you align with a tribal value set. For us, that includes um, thoughtful quality includes confidence is a big one because it's not a big label or logo brand. And our mission, our company's mission, ultimately is to create confidence through clothing. I have to ask, what was the question again? You know. How do you think about this community? This is how Gen Z is. Oh, yeah. how do I think about community? This is how Gen Z is. Fracture I points. I, I try to listen to that. Okay, um, I think about community, you know, and it comes through in the ways that I go after my customers and I retain them. But 
But for me, and that has also gone into the sustainability component of the business, which is, you know, I moved so much of how I interact and engage to digital. So, you know, I had a, I hadn't have a membership program. Everyone gets a digital card after they begin purchasing with my brand, and it flips and rotates in a 3D you know, model that can go in your story, but also you can use that at my event to get in right away. So uh, my, my biggest thing has been how am I giving to my customer this, let, let's call it added value, right? Like how am I giving them that in ways that are, I think also cool, interesting, shareable, collectible, those, those are fundamental things for me, which is how does my brand enhance the way somebody experiences it, whether it is digitally or it's a, at an event or activation I have. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's that important component, which is community is based when people now start thinking about fall risk beyond fall risk close, right? And so my MO right. is to create a community that is a thinker. Ah, that's a fall risk action. Ah, that's this. I, I no longer just think about how am I gonna get people in my clothes because for me, there's no better thing than seeing that, but for me it's really, how am I gonna get you thinking about me in the context of other parts of your world, right? And that is my idea of How do I become community. a mainstay in your world? Yeah, how do I become a mainstay? Well, so to this point about customer journey and acquisition, how are you acquiring your customers and what is, I know you have a, a somewhat unconventional journey laid out for your customer. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk about it? Sure. I, I, I think I kind of buck the trend of, you know, make things easy and, you know, deliver it in one click, like the, the Amazon Not approach. frictionless. <laughs> Not frictionless. I, I purposely, when I set out and launched Fall Risk, my MO was know as much as I possibly can, right? And so I launched the brand under a phone number, 212-982-RISK. And the only way you could purchase my brand, it, the, the, it first launched out with um, what is kind of like a QVC model. So... I was talking through the brand live, and you had to dial in to order it. And so what happened is I got people on the phone, and I immediately, first off, saw what people wanted because they're like, I want this 69 polo in teal. You know, I want this, the lay rib dress. I want this. And then I also heard them say, why isn't that in black? And of course, me, I'm like, you know, buy what I have. <laughs> But that's feedback, right? And right. so I actually took that into my mind. I'm like, it's almost like working at a boutique and hearing the, the 100 percent, 100 percent. And when I think about trends in retail, or I see those numbers from Jeff's presentation around, you know, the up here and the down here, it's the stores that I know that are doing the best are the independent boutiques. I mean, and I'm generalizing based on my kind of network and what it is. But the people who know that you already own a blazer from the row but you're gonna still link it up with your, with your denim from air or whatever mm -hmm. it is, but they know your life enough, right? And, and that is ultimately what, you know, what I think is moving that needle of also community. Those are independent communities within these stores um, that pe the women and men that shop at these stores go to them for not only where are they gonna eat, but how am I gonna look at that black tie, at this thing? How do you know my life? So how important are... Oh, thanks the other social platforms in this marketing mix. I love that you used something old school as like a landline to connect with people, a <laughs> 212 number at that. You know, we will FaceTime customers and we'll do FaceTime Fridays with Jack and it's similar, it's the person who's making all the decisions about the construction and design of the garment, having a, a, a Face to face, the best, the next best thing, you know, to face to face conversation with somebody about their lifestyle, their needs. It doesn't start with what size jeans do you wear. It starts with where and how do you live, where do you work, do you have kids, like what's your day like, and then you know, getting to know a person. Um, the stores are still the best place for us to connect with people and generate long term customer value and um, initiate a relationship. It's not just a transactional place for commerce to happen. Mm -hmm. We have. Our stores are the size of studio apartments. They're really small. They're pretty efficient. They don't have a lot of product in them. They have great energy and vibes. We spend more time, energy, attention, and money on our team members there than we do on the fixtures. Because at the end of the day, the person, the customer who comes in, or um, they don't have to be a customer, it's just a woman walking in is going to walk away with, just to your point, an experience. It's not about you know the shopping bag. And um, so nothing beats in person. That said, Instagram stories are an awesome place to, like, it's not hanging on the wall forever. It goes away after 24 hours. So mm -hmm. it's a good place to mm -hmm. let loose, be yourself, have a voice. Test. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And have a back and forth. Like, we have made so many friends with people that we've admired 
Nancy Myers is our latest one. We are obsessed with her body of work. And as a team, on late nights, we will put her movies projected on the wall. And we started DMing with her. And now our buddies with Dan Nancy Myers. Mm -hmm. And I, I like love that it's so not a barrier. Any generation, anybody you can think of, you can probably access and have an exchange with. And mm -hmm. it's an incredible tool to, again, democratize not just um, the consumerism, but the communication. It's awesome. So we use, we use Instagram as our biggest platform for reaching out and developing community and sustaining those conversations. Before we open the floor to questions from the audience, I just want to ask, as it relates to community, how you think about scaling. What scale means to you and how important it is? Because it feels probably somewhat challenging with like a phone number and the, <laughs> the FaceTiming and one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Connections, well, this and one, this is always yeah. the Achilles heel of having built a highly engaged community. Is like necessarily you are not a scalable individual. I, I knew we were going to talk about this a little bit this morning. I did my my first thing check in on Megan and Harry on the Daily Mail app, and I got served an ad that said that um, Shop Up is now available on Amazon Prime. So I guess by a partnership with Shop Up, you can order Air on Prime way before we thought that we would be able to. Amazon level service is something that we should all be aspiring to deliver. Amazon level scale is, uh, is something that, you know, that's a promise you want to be able to keep from um, an inventory and quality standpoint for sure. Um, and, and you have to decide as a brand, as custodian of the brands, like where you're going to be compromising, where you won't be. Price point for us will always be um, an obstacle to scale. A jean that's almost $200 a pair is not the most accessible jean in the, in the global market. Mm -hmm. But um, if you've decided to invest in that pair of jeans, you should be able to have it in a day. And, uh, and you should have it in a frictionless um, if you uh, exchange, if you choose, you should also be able to come hang out with us at the store for 90 minutes if you choose and try on everything. And, um, so it's our job to meet the customer wherever she is. She is in charge. She's called the shots, and it's the best time in the history of the world to be a consumer. So in terms of scale, um, you know, my MO would be to scale, but scale as I learn more info. Like, so I've dropped four volumes with my brand, and. Um, just about 80% of my consumers have bought a, a, across at least three of those drops, right? So now I know I have something. And I also see the feedback when it bring this back, I want this, I want this. Um, Amazon sells products, not brands, in, in my opinion. So an Amazon as a, as a scalable um, option for me, not now. Um, but I think my, my biggest growth will come through um, small boutiques of my own, um, continuing my e-commerce and kind of digital shopping. Um, but I, I do want to scale, but I want to scale as, it's, as I know my demand is meeting what I'm producing. Um, the definition is relative. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. For, and, I, and I don't close out anything in terms of total growth or how I'll you know, view something in tomorrow versus how I viewed it five days ago, even to be honest, when we're talking about these things. It's my job to be engaged and also with a small brand, I have the flexibility to, to lob things out and try them and see what sticks a bit, you know? And I've spent zero dollars on marketing and advertising. And, and so I, I think about this because a lot of brands that I compete against or people that are out there, you know, let, let's call them VC-backed brands, right? They're running in the red and their MO is revenue up, um, profits don't matter as much as long as revenues are up. And that's not my MO. I'm not saying I wouldn't play with some VC money, but... Um, but, but that's where scale comes. Scale comes from also investing in people. Those things require money. Mm -hmm. um, I run very lean and very hands-on. So I'm open to a lot, but that's, that's what I got in that. OK. TLDR, if you are a venture capitalist, he'd like to play with your money. <laughs> <laughs> I play smartly and friendly. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Some ama oh hi, um, we've been seeing some amazing visuals behind you that, like I would have thought were advertising. Uh -huh. So where have those run? So that's all social media, and I play in this whole world, which is I launched a brand, I compete against X Y Z. Right now, my mo is how to make you think or feel, and not untruthfully that I exist in a world. Right, so I'll I'll say it transparently, but I ran these um, billboards to launch my company. They were all. Photoshopped fake billboards. 
nobody knew. Everyone thought, oh, I have a billboard in Soho, which is a little tricky and, and confusing. Um, I understand that can be misleading to the consumer, but how does a brand who has zero dollars go out and compete against you know, the big behemoths and the big brands? And I said, F it, I'm gonna do it my way, and I'm gonna infiltrate to make you think that you've seen this. Thanks. Anyone else? And thank you for your question. Hi, this is a question for both of you. How do you guys balance your acquisition budget and your brand budget? Um, where do you put more resources? And you know, how do you deal with, on the acquisition side, maintaining brand while also understanding that you have to drive volume of orders? Um, well, like John, at the beginning, we didn't spend. And I love that. That's genius. We could have saved some time and money by just photoshopping that shirt on Oprah. <laughs> but, um, no, just kidding. She bought it. <laughs> she I love that. It's like it's amazing. Um, but uh, at the beginning, we didn't spend anywhere, and uh, that's a little bit of an overstatement. But most of the pictures that you've seen are my co-founders, <laughs> and we take them ourselves. And um, and what we've learned is that not all dollars are spent equally as we've started um, <laughs> investing. And what we think of as a sort of dollar match strategy where we look at digital marketing, which returns five times for every dollar in the next 30 days, that's a great place to start scaling. But long term, OK, those customers, uh, their average value is this, and they are going to return at this percent, and they might not come back and repeat purchase. And um, you compare that to something like building a store or launching a catalog, which are more capital intensive but create a longer term uh, connection with a person. And I think of it as literally a dollar match strategy. For every dollar that we're spending digitally, we need to match it with something that has um, a longer lifespan and that is going to attract a higher value customer either on their first order or over repeated purchases. And you get, you see the highest values in places like catalog where you can tell a story. We, we launched a catalog, kind of like a landline thing where it, our first catalog had paper dolls in it that you could cut out as something that we could only do in print and not digitally. And um, we found that that channel actually had the highest average order value even higher than our retail stores, which is higher than our website. And so we um, think about uh, uh, always a sustainable and long-term view of, of how we're you know, spending our money. Just to answer that quickly, I have zero acquisition bu budget. But I, I think as a new brand, my, my game right now is eyeballs and awareness. So my biggest way into this like customer acquisition idea is who and how can I leverage that fit into my same voice and, and like kind of brand integrity and pillars, right? So I launched one of my volumes, volume four, with Depop. It was called Remix Responsibly. Depop has 13 million users. A huge chunk of those users are Gen Z, right? So here we go. My customer aligned to their customer. Um, and I sold all of my prototype and development samples as we were talking about what you make. I sold them all as one-offs through this app of users who are curating their own stores. And I, I, that's my MO. So my customer acquisition is directly related to who and how can I partner that are going to leverage my brand. Um, so that's a zero dollar spend, but strategically plotted out against who I think is speaking to a similar base, if that answers on some way there. It's very clever. <laughs> you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, founder brands. Um, how important do you feel that you are to your brand image and identity, being front and center? People see how you wear your product, style your product, live in your product. How important are you to the image of your brand? OK, I'll answer that very quickly, which is people see my Instagram and they're like, hell no, why is he doing that? And um, that is linked to fall risk. Fall risk is built on this premise of, um, you know, you get knocked down. I had a job, a big corporate job I was let go from. I mean, I'll keep it very straight with you. And where did I go? I spiraled into shame, and how do I do this? And then I thought, that's not me. You get back up, you, pers you pursue, and you go. So I have a direct alignment to my brand, but I think I'm in the phase of what is too much and what is brand appropriate, or where do they link? But I would say I'm 100% intertwined to my brand, and I run and operate my business, my social, all of these things that way, which for some might be a little bit much sometimes and provocative. Um, so I'm finding that balance, because I do want to be responsive again to people's feedback, but. But that's my first MO is I run them completely intertwined. 
I'm the opposite, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Leandra's probably the person who should be, would give the best answer to this question, not to put you on the spot, but, but, um, but uh, in terms of, in terms of um, voice and strategy and, um, and momentum, integral in terms of identity, anonymous. I would hope that uh, air could belong to any woman in this room. And uh, it's, it's purposely not a person's name. Um, and it's not just for one type of person. That said, the company wouldn't be what it is without the six or seven people that we ha have as full-time employees. There's absolutely um, a huge contribution impact for every single individual on the team. It's the weirdest range of personalities you've ever seen. We, we shared a team member before. And we have, actually. A special guy. <laughs> we have a team member who has hiked from Mexico to Canada twice. You know, we have a, we have a, we have a, a really diverse, funky, awesome team, and our brand wouldn't be what it is without each of those ingredients in the mix. And it definitely isn't one person. Um, it's, it's, it's for sure a combination of, of a range, but. Yeah, well, you know, I think that's always been true uh, for brands, and uh, it's been heightened and probably hyper-literalized in the era of social media, but every successful business, frankly, that is out there is derivative of the distinct creative vision of one individual. And the most scalable way to take that vision or yes, to take that vision and make it the most scalable, you build a product because necessary or necessarily within that product, you, um, you, you pack this vision and then you make it en masse, right? It's a little bit more challenging when it's one specific voice like mine is, but um, I've really doubled down on building this attitude and turning Man Repeller into a platform that provides permission more than anything else, and that aligns with perspectives that are different from my own, but still very much within the world, the ecosystem that Man Repeller has built. So I would actually say that for as long as brands have existed, as long as successful businesses have existed, the uh, creative vision of one individual has always been paramount to the success. But um, what is different now is that we see the faces of these people in a way that we never used to. Oh, you've done it well. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm a showman, so, so my situation is different because, you know, I walk in there and I'm like, the star is here! <laughs> just, I don't do that. Well, well done. Well done. Though. Good luck to everyone who's coming next <laughs> on the stage. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Andy. Thank you both. Please welcome Mary Kay Bowman, head of Global Seller Solutions, Visa Inc., and Dan Van Dyke, Research Director, Business Insider Intelligence. So I'm not going to start off by saying the star is here, but uh, <laughs> you know, we're in New York City, and the world's retail leaders are sort of converging nearby for the National Retail Federation event. And this is a pretty historic moment for the retail industry. It's been 25 years since the inception of e-commerce, and that's changed the way that we pay. Since then, volume has been on a growth tear. It started at $0, and now it's at $3 trillion. Looking ahead to just the next two years, volume is expected to rise again to $6 trillion. So in the midst of this sort of exponential and rapidly increasing growth shift, Mary Kay, thank you for joining to, to shed sure. some light on this. Um, currently, you're head of seller solutions at Visa. Previously, you've held key leadership roles at Square and at Amazon, some of the most important companies in payments. So I think you would bring a unique vantage to this conversation. I want to tap into it with the first question, um, which is you see billions of transactions flowing across your network. That represents trillions of dollars. That's a wide angle lens into the state yeah. of retail. Jeff was giving uh, his thoughts on the state of retail, but I think we all want to hear what do you see as you look across the Visa network and what role does Visa play in enabling this sort of payments ecosystem? Yeah, I think it's, I'm not going to quote as many uh, uh, facts and figures as Jeff did because I, I can't speak as fast, I don't think. <laughs> um, but um, everything that he said and, uh, uh, is absolutely at play. E-commerce is extremely you know, it's here 25 years, it's no longer new, it's here to stay, but it's still growing. And it's still growing faster than um, traditional retail, if, we, if there is a thing called traditional retail anymore. And so we have to embrace those, um, uh, that, that trajectory. It also is 
digital transactions generally, mobile, um, uh, online. And I think some of the things that are interesting is what it used to be to be called e-com back when I started in e-com. And what we're talking about with the panel, the last panel is very different. Um, transactions used to start e-com and they stayed e-com. And the, the customer experience was e-com. And now it can start online and end in store. It can be enhanced by an in-app experience. And so the, um, you know, the whole playing field is changing. And uh, the fact that it is digitally native now, um, more so than uh, one or the other, um, I think is one of the things that, that we see. Um, and it's just growing. Um, and the more innovation that happens at the front of it um, is going to grow transactions. Um, so when we think about uh, what our role in that is, is to support it all. Um, we're not looking at growing e-commerce and uh, you know, uh, d declining retail. We're saying whatever customer experience is interesting and is being built by retail of uh, the current state or of the future um, or a mashup of the in-between, we're there to support it and to make those transactions safe, secure, fast, and reliable. So I think all of us here in the room today have seen a pretty rapid transformation in the way we pay. But underneath the surface, there's an equally important transformation occurring in the technology powering payments. So yeah. can you speak to the most important trends that you're seeing there? Yeah, I can, I can talk a little bit about that. Because I was on the other side of the fence kind of innovating on the retail side, I can also say what's changed. Um, so if I think about you know, 15 to 20 years ago when we were building e-commerce out of uh, the capabilities that were there, the payments ecosystem, uh, electronic payments were available. Um, but they were really kind of governed by a handful of technology um, providers, you know, point of sale um, systems and, and big, large banks. And now we have hundreds and thousands of innovators in fintech that are coming together and looking at how we can take apart those pieces and uh, assemble them in different ways to support different customer experiences. Um, so I think um, one of the things that would have been like kind of out of the box um, and sometimes really big boxes like cash registers and terminals is changing to APIs and to component services and to software that makes it easier to build the experiences that um, somebody needs to do to support their ideas. Um, again, to make it fast, secure, um, and reliable. That's what, that's what the sellers want from us and that's what consumers want from us. One of the um, areas that I think we've in, um, kind of put a lot of our innovation space in is in tokenization. Um, those are the things that um, were kind of unbundled from the big boxes, the cash registers and the, uh, the big equipment that we had seen um, and looked at how, how do we make that um, available to innovators? How can they build on top of that to create new customer experiences? Um, so tokenization is something that we want uh, to but we think is driving a lot of the um, other experiences because it just works. Once you get it uh, implemented, it, it, it just works and it's there for you so that the closing of the sale um, is not in the way of the customer experience that Maggie and John were talking about before. So tokenization, it's the age of mass data breaches, and I think it's an important concept. It's also a five-syllable word. It's <laughs> difficult to get across. So what's your plan to get the, the message about the benefits out to consumers and to merchants alike? Yeah, so the, it is a, it's, a great, it's a great point, you know, kind of leading with tokenization as opposed to like denim and brand and empathy and experience. You're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Um, and so the, the reality is that customers don't want to talk about tokenizations. We probably will never use that five-syllable word with customers. Um, but they want to know that their transactions, that their ability to close the sale is secure. It's just going to work. It's just going to happen. Um, on, the, uh, on the seller side, I think um, they're looking for ease of implementation. They're looking to reduce their um, commitment to having to put their um, technology resources or their um, financial spend into um, developing you know, complicated um, uh, capabilities to protect customer data. So we make that, uh, with tokenization, available to them. Um, and that's, I think that's where we're kind of changing the, the game. So I I talked a little bit about data breaches, and I think that's one important factor behind the rise of tokenization. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the other key drivers of this trend? 
So I think some of the key drivers are, um, you know, just what we were talking about, the rise of the, the digitally enhanced experience that people are putting together, um, mobile first or e-com first, um, which means that customers are having to hand over a lot of data and then uh, it's processed kind of behind the scenes. Um, and so we need to make all of those connections secure. That's a very fragmented experience. There's lots of different technologies out there that, um, that brands are using. Um, and we want to make sure that those are all connected in a uh, safe, secure manner. And that's why like the tokenization focus is to make it easier for the developers that they're using or the technology platforms that they're using to build that kind of uh, top grade uh, security into um, that. But the factors really are the growth of e-commerce, the growth of mobile commerce, and the growth of digital experiences. So uh, Jeff had a great visual of a 500-pound gorilla, and I think there's a two-ton elephant in the room. You know, Visa yesterday uh, made an acquisition, a, a Plaid, $5 billion, 5.3. Um, can you speak to that at all? Well, um, it's very early days. It's less than 24 hours, in fact. And so we, we don't have a lot more to say than what we said yesterday. But uh, we're very excited. Um, there's very much more to come, and it's, it's very much in keeping with this um, enabling uh, technologists to build better experiences for our customers and for our sellers. So earlier when we were talking before the session, you brought up guest checkout, and it's one of the more painful experiences in e-commerce, as you yeah. put it. What makes it so painful today, and ultimately what can be done to solve that issue? Yeah, so um, it really does tie in with the, the kind of security and the tokenization experiences, because those tokenization um, and e-commerce, it's a great experience. I'm, I'm sure everybody is a registered user at least one site or app. Um, and it's very easy. Once you get registered, it's very easy to check out. It's very seamless. It's very frictionless, as we talked about before. But 40% of um, our transactions that occur digitally are still under kind of a guest checkout experience, which means they don't have all of our data. We do have to fill out a lot of forms. And uh, it really slows down the experience. Um, and the where we want to make um, progress is to make that customer experience for guest checkout as safe and secure as a uh, registered experience, um, but also as convenient. We don't want to see the kind of, you know, more than, you know, I think, I think still more than half of transaction or um, experiences, uh, people experience cart abandonment. So half the time, uh, people are leaving the experience and not closing the sale. That's bad for the sellers, but it's also bad for the the, the customers, and so what we're looking to do is take the benefits of tokenization and the other components that we have and build it into a, um, a guest checkout experience as well. So with SRC, there, there are a number of different buy buttons. You're, you're coming yeah. at this a little bit you know, late to the game, admittedly, but yeah. you, you have scale playing to your advantage. What, what makes you confident that you can get a competitive edge and stand out with this SRC uh, group effort? Well, the SRC effort, or the, the buy button that um, can make a, a guest experience as seamless as a registered experience or a recognized experience, um, is something that we've been working on for a couple of years. Um, and it does take a lot of people to coordinate. So that's one of the things, um, when you can say a little bit of the elephant in the room, it seems like we're moving slow, but we're really aligning sellers um, other service providers, other banks, and other networks under to a global standard. And that's really important for our sellers um, because they don't want to invest in technology twice. They want to invest in their brand. They want to invest in their denim wear. They want to invest in their service. They don't necessarily want to invest their uh, time and money in building, another, um, uh, building on another standard. So um, working together uh, with the rest of the industry to consolidate the kind of you know, it's almost like a NASCAR experience. You see all of the different badges and buttons on the checkout experience, and it can be confusing for buyers, but it's also really expensive for sellers to implement all of those different buttons. And so consolidating um, to a, a uniform experience is something that we think will ultimately benefit our, um, our customers and our, and our buyers. So with SRC, you're, you're joining up with a number of industry stakeholders, yep. and I think we've seen consortiums that are extremely successful. So Visa was formed as a bank association. Uh, you, you might have heard of Visa. And, a few years ago. Yeah, yes. um, but there's also been some major failures. So MCX, the merchant mobile wallet, hundreds of millions of dollars were poured into that, and ultimately it went nowhere. Right. So what makes you confident that the consortium backing SRC will prove successful? Well, first of all, 
100% accurate. It's very hard to move multiple players who have to be aligned across uh, multiple aspects. So we have technology providers, we have uh, financial networks, we have banks that all have to get on the same page and move forward together. I think that, um, and there's many examples of where that was difficult. It's always difficult, but in some cases it doesn't work as well. I think here we're, we all are aligned on making sure that the experience is easy um, for buyers and for sellers, that it becomes very recognized that that buy button is safe and secure, and if I'm not a registered guest on a particular site, that I can use this and check out um, uh, quickly and swiftly. Um, but it also goes beyond the buy button. Um, we're not just looking at this as an experience for e-commerce and guest checkout, but we're also looking at this towards the future. So what mobile integrations can we have or what um, uh, you know, uh, voice commerce uh, kind of applications could there be? So this is also just a, a tool for, um, uh, for developers to use. So we not only have the button, but we also have APIs and SDKs so we can take that um, expedited checkout experience and uh, with SRC and, um, and put that through. We're also con um, converting our own buy button uh, in the next week over to the SRC experience to make it easier so that we can kind of prime the pump and get things rolling. So voice payments is something that's personally fascinating to me. I I've written a couple reports on it. My team has written research on it as well. I'm kind of curious to see if you could walk me through what SRC would ultimately contribute to that voice payment flow? Sure. Um, I think, you know, when you think about, we talk a lot about uh, Internet of Things, and we talk about wearables, and we talk about all of these new commerce experiences, like you can buy something from your scale in your bathroom, or, so, you know, those types of things. Um, and we just talked about the 25th year anniversary of e-commerce. Many of these things were talked about 10 and 15 years ago, but e-commerce is really coming to its own and now. It does take a while for customers to adopt those experiences. So when I think about voice, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what it's gonna look like. Um, I know there are people at Google and at Amazon working on these um, experiences, embedding them into cars. We have a, an integration with Sirius um, for IoT, and uh, those will come together but when we think about, uh, when I think about it from a product perspective, I do think about um, providing builders, the developers that are behind these uh, innovations with the tools to actually do that innovation. And that comes from uh, Express Checkout and SRC, um, unrecognized checkout experience, registered experience for, uh, through an API or SDK. So I think we have time for one more question. And looking ahead to the near future, SRC is going to come into the market. What are some challenges that could ultimately impede its success? What are you doing to design around those challenges? And what do all the merchants in the room need to know and do as this technology comes to market? So I think one of the things that, uh, what could impede the progress is that people uh, don't, don't understand it, don't know about it, are uh, too busy, they have too many other um, uh, things to implement on their backlog. Um, to get it done. I think one of the things that um, is the most important thing is to know that the kind of tipping point is now with both tokenization and SRC. Um, tokenized transactions are, are at the kind of trillion dollar uh, purchase volume level. This is not something that's going to go away. Um, it's time to kind of get on uh, the board. It's not going to be a bad investment. You're, it's not, you're not going to have to do it twice. And I think the same thing for SRC, um, which is, uh, you know, we'll be converting our um, Visa checkout buttons to SRC. There's going to be lots of volume on it. Your investment in it is kind of, it's real. It's, the tipping point is now. And if you um, want to know how to um, make that work for your retail business, whether it's e-commerce or online or in-app or in-store, um, we, uh, we're here for you. Call us. Um, call us. Call your service providers. That's your technology providers. We're partners with them or your financial service providers. Uh, we're all working together to make it easier for retail to transform and innovate using tokenization and SRC. Great, thank you so much. So at this point, we have time for a Q&A. Uh, if anybody has questions, please raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you. <laughs> so, so Jeff mentioned uh, when he was talking about Amazon and security, 
Amazon knows what underwear we buy, all these <laughs> kinds of things, we have all the boxes, and yet there's this perceived threat with security, with payments and, and, and these kinds of things. It seems to me like a lot of people just kind of shut down when you start talking about security. And, and so how, how do you think about educating a consumer base as they're using these, these new technologies and products without kind of getting them just to shut, you know, so it's one thing for retailers to adopt these technologies. It's another thing to get the 70% of the people who aren't using the frictionless payment or, the, or other technologies to use it. How do you think about your role in that process and, 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 and what does that look like? So I think we're here to educate not only customers, the end user that you're talking about, people who are worried about, well, what's happening to my data? But we're here to um, work with our developer community and our financial service provider community and our seller community to um, help customers understand what is at risk and what isn't at risk and what tools we employ across the ecosystem to make those transactions safe. And that's what tokenization is all about. It's, it's literally for the financial data that you're putting through um, to close the sale, um, we're ensuring that that data cannot be uh, you know, cannot be lost or, or, and that it can be trusted. That's the most imp important thing for, um, from a consumer perspective, I think, is that we work together, whether we're, you know, whether there are retailers uh, or retailers of the future in the room or financial service providers, fintechs, um, or, or brands like Visa, that we work together to make sure that customers understand that the solutions that we implement together through the whole pipeline uh, are trusted, um, not you know that they understand all of the you know encryption modeling or um, all of the uses um, that we enable, but that they don't have to worry about it because we collectively have got their back by using these kind of services under the surface. Does anybody else have a question? Stun silence. Stun silence. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Please welcome Arpan Potaturi, Director of Product, Shopify, Michelle Cordero Grand, Founder and CEO, Lively, and Anya Kane, Senior Retail Reporter, Business Insider. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out to Ignition today. So, everyone in this room has presumably heard of the retail apocalypse. Uh, the much-publicized demise of brick-and-mortar stores across the country. But the reality is a bit more complicated than the term would suggest. Brick-and-mortar isn't dead. Consumers still crave those in-person experiences, even as they embrace the convenience of e-commerce. And for retailers big or flexible enough to foster both bricks and clicks, that presents an opportunity. One set of comp companies that has largely already begun to see success by doubling down on this multi-channel approach are direct-to-consumer brands. I'm excited to have the chance today to speak with Arpan Potatori, the director of product at Shopify, the e-commerce company providing DTC clients with products that enhance the in-store shopping experience, and Michelle Cordero Grant, the, a Shopify client and the founder and CEO of Lively, a digitally native underwear brand taking on the $13 billion lingerie business. With the help of pro uh, platforms like Shopify, DTC brands like Lively are taking charge of their channels, meeting consumers' e-commerce and brick and mortar needs, and changing retail as we know it today. Thank you both so much for coming out today. Thanks for having us. Good morning. Um, so let's just jump in. Um, Arpan, can you tell me a bit about how Shopify helps brands like Lively to set up a retail presence? Sure. Um, you know, most people think of Shopify as basically just an e-commerce platform. Um, but Shopify is a lot more than that. We have um, a point of sale system that is powering thousands of brick and mortar stores. We have banking products. We have um, you know, an enterprise offering, shipping offerings. Um, and so for us, it's really about just understanding the kind of merchant journey and looking at uh, merchants who are scaling online and thinking about how um, they want to open uh, brick and mortar stores and helping them with every step along the way from um, you know, setting up their point of sales to figuring out using their online data where they should open stores to understanding their customer data. Um, and so just kind of every part of that journey. Definitely. And Michelle, on your end, what sort of problems uh, is Shopify helping you guys solve at Lively? 
Sure. Um, you know, thinking about just the way that we launched our company, I launched Lively for $199 on my iPhone. <laughs> I didn't have a developer, any of those things. I was able to really focus on brand, community, and experience for literally $200. And now, fast forwarding four years later, we're obviously a multifaceted company um, with e-commerce, wholesale, and four brick and mortar stores, and yet still we have one developer. And what that means is Shopify allows us to not focus on, on how we're gonna do things, like how are we gonna offer an amazing returns experience, or how are we gonna launch brick and mortar? They actually give us the opportunity to focus on what do we wanna do? Where do we want to sell our product and what experiences do we want to give those consumers? Shopify has a plug-in and a community of people offering technology that allow you to bring that together in one place. And yet still I can change my homepage on my iPhone. <laughs> you mentioned your brick and mortar presence um, and you've also unleashed a string of pop-ups across the country introducing this athleisure, I'm sorry, uh, uh, leisure uh, blend of lingerie, activewear, and swimwear, you know, to, to consumers in cities across the country. Um, I guess, could you tell me a bit about what makes a successful pop-up store for Lively and what you're thinking about as you're opening those different locations? Sure. So we launched Lively in 2016. We had 100 ambassadors that really shared and shouted our brand. And quickly, we were able to ship to every state within the country, now leaning into 100,000 ambassadors across the country. Um, sharing and shouting the brand. Now the reason I share that with a question around pop-ups is they are the reason we started having pop-ups. We were having all of these different events to bring them together physically to drive a digital experience. And Shopify allowed us to have a pop-up where we didn't even need a cash register. We just needed product and an iPad or a phone that we could check out on. Now what do those pop-ups mean today? I grew up in retail with big retailers like Federated and Victoria's Secret where retail was about dollars per square foot and you had all of these, these racks and amazing you know, uh, cash registers and so forth. Pop-ups today is more about the experience you're giving the consumer. They don't need to come to a store to buy. They want to come to a store to have human interaction. They need something to do that's not on their screen anymore. And that's what the pop-up gives us. It gives us that three-dimensional experience of what our brand means beyond the bra. It's about the community and the experience creating brand stickiness. So this is a question for both of you, um, but those experiences that your consumers are having in those pop-ups, you know, what, what, do, what, does it, what goes into that in order to make um, a kind of a continued relationship with that customer last? What hooks them in and, and translates into clicks later on, I suppose? Sure. What we find and what you know, I believe is that brand is about human impact. It's about the emotion that is sparked when they see the logo. So yes, the bra is important you know, that we sell at Lively, but more importantly is what does the brand feel and mean when they see the word? When I worked at Victoria's Secret, it was angel fantasy push-up. Lively stands for passion, purpose, and confidence. And so the pop-up is about giving experiences that drive those three words. And for us, it has nothing to do with lingerie or bras. It has everything to do with what those consumers are doing in real life today. And what does that mean? In 2016, they were talking about soul cycle and succulents and entrepreneurship. And so we were having experiences about soul cycle, succulents, and entrepreneurship. <laughs> and what does that mean today? It's about them launching their own books, writing blogs. What does motherhood mean? And so those experiences are about creating emotional moments that drive euphoric um, endorphins and so forth, where they go home. They post on social media, they tell their mom, their sister, their aunt, I went and I did this tonight. Oh, by the way, it was sponsored by Lively. And I went and I learned and I met this person. Oh, by the way, it was at an event sponsored by Lively. Yeah, for us, you know, we hear the, we hear the term experiential retail all the time. And I think it, to, to Michelle's point, it means different things for different brands. And the most important thing is that it's authentic to that brand. Um, you know, I ask a lot of people when, when, when we're out talking to merchants kind of, what is the most, um, like how do you connect with your merchants and your stores? And it always comes down to, um, it's an articulation of our brand values in a physical space. Um, you know, and, the, and the, the best kind of experiential retail, in our opinion, is the, is the, are the experiences that are really repeatable. You know, they're not just kind of the one-off gimmicks that you go to a store and you can do the one-time kind of Instagram selfie and, and call it a day. They're really like, 
the experiences where you want to go back time after time after time because the service is great, because they offer repairs, because you have a relationship with that person that's working there, because you're getting value in the store that you can't get online. And so if you can create that repeatable value that's just different from your online experience, um, you know, we see a lot of merchants that are leaning into, into that sort of focus. So showcasing your personality and your values through these experiences, not just some gimmicky uh, pop-up. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the biggest change in terms of consumer preferences that's driving this sort of um, people being so interested in these pop-ups and, and this kind of multi-channel approach? You know, when I think about it, uh, you know, pre-social media and digital marketing platforms, Brick and mortar was the place that you transacted. It was the option to where you went and bought something. And then you know the rise of digital happened, and people had the choice of no longer needing to go to malls and stores, and it was an amazing experience where they could buy on their phones and their laptops. Now you fast forward seven to 10 years later, people are fatigued of being on their phones. Gen Zs have grown up on screens. They're looking for human interaction and, frankly, something to do. And so what these pop-ups allow them to do is engage in the experiences and the moments that they're really interested in while transacting without all of the friction. So enter Uber, Glam Squad, Dry Bar, you can now have all these experiences and services without the friction, and you combine that with things that you're interested in, whether that's the latest book, blog, fitness class, et cetera, all offered by a brand that is gonna leave an impression on you when you walk out of the door. Yeah, we, I think digital fatigue is a, is a real thing. And you know, it's, it's a huge part of all of our lives, and, and we check every chance that we have. Um, but there's just something really freeing about walking into a store and, and not thinking about your phone for 10 minutes and just being able to um, learn about products. And I read a stat recently that was basically um, four out of five buyers think that they know more about the products and services that a brand offers than the people that work there, which is sort of an interesting insight into human psychology, but also, um, you know, I think it just speaks to uh, stores really need to work hard to meet buyers where they are. Um, and as soon as they walk in, figuring out how to engage buyers quickly um, and, and really just pull them away from their, from their screens um, and, and get them into conversation, um, that's the challenge and, and something that we're, you know, we're excited to work on at Shop5. Absolutely. I think drawing upon that, Michelle, I've heard you describe Lively as more than a brand, but a community, a supportive community for women. Um, I guess could you guys talk a bit about how Lively and Shopify sort of bounce off each other in order to really facilitate that community feel, you know, long after uh, your customer leaves the pop-up store? Sure. Um, you know, I think it really starts with the idea of all, seeing your consumer base in one place. So it's not like we look at our e-commerce business in P&L and then we look at our store business in P&L as you know, all of those who lived in retail, we often did that. We easily can see what's happening now across the entire atmosphere of Lively, who those women are, all of the age, age ranges that we're spanning, all of the geographies, the economic households, et cetera. So that's where the community is really is visible to us. And so what Shopify allows us to do is to, to give back to them, to create a personalized experience that will become more and more personalized and dynamic as the technology evolves. But we can treat them as an individual, not as a cohort and not as a group. And I think that's where the word community comes into play. Because for us, community is defined by a common thread line of mindset. But that doesn't mean that you're all the same age, the same interest, the same profession. You have some type of connection in terms of the way you see the world and what you want from the world. And now we can take that to a business element where it's about offering you a bra that is catering to the uniqueness of your individual body shape because even if you're the same size, your body is definitely different. And so we can offer products that cater to that, but also an experience that's supported by technology that supports that. I think a great example is our pop-up stores on average are 12 to 1,500 square feet, but I would say seven to 800 square feet is really about product. The other half of it is about a place to sit down and have a chat with someone that you enjoy their company. The dressing rooms, when you go in, you're often shopping for bras with a friend or a family member. And so if you're in adjacent dressing rooms, you can open the curtain in between and have one big room now because we know women, they don't wanna walk out of a dressing room and show their mom their bra or their friend in a public environment. They wanna do that together. 
because we've had the technology to support all of this, we actually have the mind space and the time to think about these logical experiences, things that were always, you know, should have been table stakes in retail, but we actually never had the mind space to focus on that. And I think that's where I feel that Shopify really supports us. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds crazy to say it, but just the idea of having your e-commerce business, your online sales channels connect to your retail sales channels, for a lot of businesses, this is still a major pain point. It's still really expensive. They can't figure out ways to get a global view on, on their analytics, on their customers, on their orders, on their inventory. And you know that's really what we're able to offer in, in kind of one single package and make that accessible so that entrepreneurs like Michelle can work on you know, building community and building their brands and telling their stories and connecting with their customers and not kind of worrying about their, their back end infrastructure and all the kind of um, complexity that goes along with it. I would say the other you know, probably obvious thing that we're not mentioning is previous to you know, Shopify, I would have thought opening a store was this big, crazy, wild you know, project that was gonna be six figures and wildly expensive and so forth. And it's not. We opened our first pop-up for $10,000 total, including our flights and our meals to the city in which it was at. And all we had was, again, an app and a little thing that we plugged into our phones and iPads. Wow, tearing down those barriers. <laughs> um, I guess uh, Arpon, I know in 2019, Shopify overhauled some of its systems, um, making, adding uh, solutions like inventory lookup and, and making it possible for retail employees to facilitate sales of even out-of-stock products. Um, I suppose my question is, what are your retail partners clamoring for next? Yeah, I think um, more uh, functionality that just makes the experiences seamless across online and offline. We heard earlier today about the rise of buy online, pick up in store, and that's just really, you know, the kind of tip of the iceberg here. But we we feel like um, the best retail experiences are driving at some kind of personalization in store, and personalization has a weird kind of connotation, like it, it can mean, you know, kind of algorithms and things like that. We think in retail stores, personalization will mean human relationships that are driven by people that have the right information to, again, meet those buyers where they are, to understand, you know, their purchase history online, and to do that in a non kind of privacy um, creepy way. <laughs> um, and to us, that's the real challenge. How do we make that, um, you know, opt in on both sides so that people understand what they're walking into, and they can get that personalized experience that's really valuable. Um, and I think we'll just see a lot more of that, uh, kind of combining the online and offline, but doing it in a, in a really buyer-friendly way. And Michelle, um, jumping off that, you mentioned kind of getting to know uh, these consumers in your community. Um, tell me a bit more about how you guys are using that data to make to really personalize these shopping experience for folks. Sure. So outside of you know the experiential part, which I mentioned, you know really understanding what they're interested in from um, an activation standpoint, then going into what is their product journey. So what is the first product that most women decide they want to buy when they join the lively community, and then what is that product journey afterwards? Because what we see is typically women buy two to three bras you know, every two years, if you're really honest about it. Um, but what we're finding is women are actually swapping out their drawers, and we want to understand why and who those women are and what type of lifestyles they're leading. Are they women in finance? Are they women in, uh, you know, new to motherhood? Or are they living multifaceted lives? And we can find that out by really bumping up the information on transaction history, but also what they're offering us in user-generated content and so forth. I think the other part you know, that kind of hinges on what you were saying about personalization is we do see a future in which someone can come into the store and they can decide what information they want to offer us. Do they want us to know their purchase pattern? Do they want us to know that this month's their birthday? Or do they want to shop anonymously? But giving people the permission to decide what type of experience they want to have when they enter the store is something we're passionate about seeing in the future. At the end of the day, we believe in human um, infrastructure in our stores. We feel like technology will not replace humans in our store, but where we're using human capital will transition towards the consumer experience and less about the transaction in the cash register. Right now, everyone's huddled around the cash register and the inventory. If you look at where the employees are in a store, it's at the end of the journey, not at the front. And so we want to pull that to the front. Absolutely. Um, I want to pull out and kind of look at retail in general for a second. Um, and, and, you know, 
Shopify works with a lot of up and comers. Lively was founded in 2016. I mean, if you had to think of a legacy brand, perhaps, that you feel is really killing this, uh, this uh, multi-channel approach, what, what comes to mind for you guys? I, I've been really impressed um, lately with Nike. I think that you know, their store in Soho is always jammed. They're doing a really good job of localizing their, their uh, stores and, and bringing some of that local flavor to every kind of Nike store that they have. They're leaning into community and the Nike run clubs and things like that. Um, and on the personalization front, they're building fit profiles. Um, you know, they're really, I think, taking, um, taking back a lot of their brand capital and they're figuring out how they want to own some of that through their own drops, through their own exclusive products, through their own launches that happen on Nike.com or in their own, um, in their own uh, properties. Um, and so uh, I, I think they're, they're, they're doing just kind of amazing things and, and, and building such a big community around their brand again. I would say I'll lean on the other side of the industry um, and I'll mention Nordstrom because they're someone who came to us when we first launched our brand. We weren't ready for that part of the retail industry, but two years later, we step, you know, we continue the conversation and they figured out how to customize an experience for Lively without all the red tape, EDI, the hangers, all the nonsense that you really need to go into that. They broke down the barriers, but in addition to that, they're creating an experience is, you go to the tower, I was there last night, you can shop, I could have a, you know, a cup of soup and dinner, go to an, an event, which I did. You could literally spend the whole day there going from fitness to shopping to dinner, et cetera. And that is like where, again, I would want to spend an afternoon with the people that I love. Absolutely. And then I think we have time for one more question, but if you could boil it down, what, what is exciting you right now in the world of retail? I think just uh, for us, we see a lot of really um, smart entrepreneurs who have tested and learned their way into success online. And we're seeing that behavior happen in the real world. And so be it through pop-ups or opening their own brick and mortar stores or scaling in the way that Allbirds has and they're opening up just tons of stores, right? But in every one of those instances, they are really testing and learning. And we just see that retail is moving so fast and you have to be experimenting, you have to be trying, you have to be testing, learning, and failing at times. Um, and just the volume of ideas that are coming out is super inspiring. I think that's the real trend that we're gonna see is just you're gonna see lots of different kind of iterations of how to attract customers in stores. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing recently that, that we saw um, uh, when we were going through the Casper, actually, S1, which is, you know, amazing credit to them for going that far, but that the cost of acquiring customers for them is roughly the same as the cost of making product, which is just crazy. And so the ideas that our merchants have to acquire customers is really the thing that mo most excites me. I think we're going to see some really interesting things there. Absolutely. Michelle? For me, it's um, how flexibility and agility have now come into the world of retail. Um, I used to feel like I was on these motherships where you couldn't make turns and try things and do things differently, but now you're seeing it from legacy companies with digitally native new brands coming together, and the industry is now becoming more flexible and agile. Examples being, you know, a year ago, we didn't even have one store, now we have four, and we have flexible leases on those stores where it's a 12 to 18 month you know, contract that can go to five years. But if you rewind it, you know, five to seven years ago, it was, had to be a five-year lease, it had to be a 10-year lease. There were all of these rules. Those rules are out the door now so that we can really focus on consumer experience and what people actually want in a frictionless transactional environment. Absolutely, thank you guys. Um, so now we're gonna kick it off to you guys for some Q&A. Anyone have any questions? All of your conversation has been about infrastructure and about executing the sale. But what, talk to me about customer acquisition. Talk to me about how you're building awareness for your brand to drive traffic to your site as well as branded search. Sure. You wanna go for that? Sure. <laughs> so, you know, kind of actually bridging on the last question that we answered. Customer acquisition, if you thought about it, five years ago, customer acquisition was this open pasture on digitally native platforms. So you were easily able to acquire a lot of customers through Facebook and Instagram and Google and so forth, maybe seven to eight years ago with ease. 
open pasture. That pasture is now full and very saturated. So what I think is really interesting now, it's the combination of what was customer acquisition before digitally native platforms with the support of digitally native platforms. So I encourage my team at Lively to think about how did you learn about brands before Instagram and Facebook? It was about visual impressions grassroots word of mouth. And that's actually how Lively launched. We launched with word of mouth on Instagram and through our email list, but with those physical experiences. So people thought I was crazy when we were two weeks old and we were having events and interactions because it was a lot of sweat equity. But that's, again, back to humans coming together and then sharing and shouting a brand. We used to learn about brands on, on billboards, magazines, TV, et cetera. Where we see customer acquisition actually happening is bringing those two places together again. Like direct mail is buzzy again, right? It's because direct mail is one impression that's powerful when you're also using Google and Facebook to come together to get the acquisition and the transaction to happen. It's the combination of both. Yeah, we, at Shopify, we have a number of um, marketing tools. And so we have integrations with Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, uh, Amazon, eBay. And so you can extend your, your sales into a, a number of different sales channels, including your point of sale and brick and mortar stores. Um, we also have advertising products and things like that, Shopify email. And so there are a number of, of, of different channels. I think to Michelle's point, it's just sort of up to the entrepreneurs to, to figure out what that mix is because you know, the seven or eight years ago when you could go on, uh, quickly buy AdWords, uh, go on Facebook and target the right audiences and on Instagram, um, those, are, those are still outstanding channels. They're just more and more expensive and they're, and they're really um, pretty saturated. And so just that mix across direct mail, across events, across your brick and mortar stores, billboards and digital channels, you have to find the right balance there now. In the last two years, 150 or more e-commerce companies, digital native firms, have used television because it's an efficient and expensive way <clears throat> for reaching frequency and to drive branded search and site visits. Is that something that Shopify endorses? Is it something that your uh, that Lively has uh, investigated? From a Shopify perspective, we don't have um, uh, particular integrations to help merchants buy spots on TV. But if it works for merchants, uh, we're all for it. And I think it's, again, it's just another channel in the mix. And um, you know, I don't know if Lively has tried it yet. Sure. It's actually something that we've been researching um, and considering quite um, seriously. And really, it's just because of the curve of our brand, right? So when we were sub $100,000, we were organic and email. And then you know, and now with that we're a multi-million dollar company, the mix of our marketing channels has become much more diverse. But TV is interesting. And actually, if you thought about it seven years ago, people were not talking about TV as the mix. But it's just, again, it's back to that pendulum, right? It was all about stores. It was all about digital. And now we're finding this beautiful equilibrium. Thank you so much for your questions. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But thank you, guys. Great thank insight. You. Please welcome Layla Amjadi, Product Manager, Instagram Shopping, Salima Prapadia, Senior Vice President, Global Online Customer Acquisition and Retention, the Estee Lauder Companies, and Haley Peterson, Senior Correspondent, Business Insider. Social media and Instagram in particular have had a huge impact on how we shop. In the past, we browsed department stores and fashion magazines to tell us what to buy. Now we're increasingly turning to social media influencers to steer us to the right products. This shift has been felt across the retail industry, and it's perhaps been felt the strongest within the beauty sector, where live makeup tutorials have fueled trends like contouring and driven interest in skincare routines and this has translated directly into sales. I'm here with Layla of Instagram and Salima of Estee Lauder to talk about the intersection of social media, shopping, influencers, and brands. 
Layla heads the team responsible for making shopping easier on Instagram, and Salima is in charge of customer acquisition and retention online for Estee Lauder. So first, I'd like to start with you, Salima. From your experience at Estee Lauder, which owns more than 20 brands, what has Instagram fundamentally changed about the business of buying and selling cosmetics and skincare products? Well, first, um, it's such a visual platform. So it's so um, complementary to the way we sell beauty, right? Um, our products evoke emotional responses, and Instagram has allowed our brands to tell their stories in a much very different way and a very visual way. So we've seen a lot more content be developed, a lot more interactive content, whether that be video um, or images, um, in a very different way, you know? And so as mobile has evolved and as Instagram has evolved, you know, its platform, our consumer behavior is also involved. So as a content and finding the consumers in one place come together, it kind of converges to be the, the ecosystem that, that we need. So it has changed our media mix and our marketing mix, um, where we need to find the consumers, how we think about how the consumers interact with our brands. So it has really fundamentally um, shifted the entire business. How do you manage that level of feedback? I mean, with, with across all of these brands, um, the amount the, of customers that are coming to you online, on Instagram, and, and giving you feedback on your products, what they want next, what they like or dislike about certain products, how do you manage that all and sift through it? Very iteratively. So it's, you know, for each brand, they're on their journey. Obviously, we have over 20 brands. Um, for our brands, you know, being true to their authentic DNA, how they sell, how consumers perceive them, is very important. But there's lots of stories to tell for each brand. Um, and so they're continuing to involve their, evolve their relationship and understand different consumer types and how they need to tell their story to different consumer types. Now, Salima, uh, sorry, Layla, from your perspective, um, how has the beauty industry evolved on Instagram? Um, what are customers and brands and influencers doing differently today than they were five years ago? Yeah, so at Instagram, we've been totally blown away as to how the community has actually evolved Instagram to be a place for shopping, and it's for sure happening within beauty. And that really just started from the fact that um, interests have really been a part of Instagram's DNA from the very beginning. We say that you come for your friends and family, but you stay for your interests and your hobbies. And beauty has been a big interest community. It's one of the biggest interest communities on Instagram. And it really started off with um, you know, that community building, that conversation between um, brands and people um, in a really, very much of a relationship building way. And, Brands have been a part of the interest community from the very beginning, and they've been showing up uh, like your friends. You know, they're not just talking about products, but they start off talking about you know that brand story, that brand equity, and building those relationships. And so naturally, over time, those relationships have lent themselves to more commerce activity. And so it's been transitioning from relationship building, but now that that trust is there, people are now talking about products. Um, and that, as a result, is something that we have been paying attention to and following, because at the end of the day, when we build product on Instagram, we take signal from our community and how our community is using the product, and we try to evolve with them to help them do whatever they're trying to do more easily. And that was really the impetus for Instagram shopping overall. Um, so we started out the product in answering questions around discovery, but as the discovery questions have been starting to be answered, that's where we've started to move um, into consideration and, and most recently on to uh, check out the ability to buy on Instagram. So really taking that signal from where the community wants to go. Great, and I'd like to talk about some of those tools yeah. um, a little later on. First of all, I'd love to talk about um, Generation Z. This is the next class of consumers that's younger than millennials, born mid-1990s and later. Um, they're highly engaged on social media. Uh, Layla, in what ways are they using Instagram differently than other generations? And Salima, what is your consumer research telling you about what Generation Z wants more than anything in the products that they buy? We'll start with you, Layla. Yeah, so I think if we uh, ask the question of how Generation Z is looking or looking to Instagram differently for shopping, I think uh, what we look at is, well, what's working for them in their shopping experience? Um, and it's three things. 
One is shopping experiences and relationships with brands where that brand and those products and that content is very much engaging in real-time culture. Um, so it's about um, relationships where that brand, yes, is talking about product, but is not afraid to be nimble in their content strategy and have a conversation more broadly about something broader in the beauty community, for example, or something broadly that's happening in the world. So um, brands really showing up like your friends and being a part of the conversation is critical for building that relationship with that Gen Z shopper. Um, the second is um, products that resonate with them or products that really feel f uh, by and for them. So I see you know, a lot of brands that I follow are increasingly using things like the polling sticker and stories where they're effectively asking people, um, you know, do you need this or that sort of product more? Or I remember Jen Atkin basically reverse engineered her CalPAC suitcase that she did collab by asking her community um, their preferences. And so then when the product comes out, it very much feels by them and, and that resonates. Um, and then the third thing is the way that I think people, uh, Gen Z likes to be um, talked to in terms of shopping activity in particular, now we're moving into commerce, um, they really value that authentic conversation. And what authenticity here means, means give it to me straight. Like if you actually wanna sell me this product right now, be really clear and be direct and don't be afraid to tell me why I should be excited about it. And I think that's really a function of the fact that even uh, this generation is selling a lot of their own products. So that conversation about product, talking about product, evangelizing brands is very comfortable for this population of shoppers and anything but that feels actually disingenuine. I feel like it's really hard to um, kind of toe the line between being authentic and, and coming off as trying to be authentic. Mm -hmm. How, what are the best brands and influencers doing out there to actually um, appear authentic? What can they do to not seem like they're trying too hard? Uh, you know, that's always up to the consumer, and you see it right away. You see it in, in how they react, um, whether it's an engagement, whether, you know, it's a click, whether it's an actual purchase. Um, so really, you know, the authentic element of it, um, you can tell right away because of the way that this consumer base reacts so, um, so quickly, right? They're digitally native. They're used to, they know how to pull or react mm -hmm. with their, their like or their, you know, their swipe really quickly. Um, so that's a lot of the cues that you take in, in terms of the engagement. Um, but also trying to attract them, it, it is really about being authentic, right? Mm -hmm. And also being fit to the purpose um, and what they need and how they need it. But also there's a big element of um, cause-based um, and being uh, you know, important to something bigger than just um, the company, right? So you look at something, uh, a brand of ours, Mac. Mm -hmm. You know, to when they started, you know, they were the first one with Viva Glam, um, having RuPaul as, as their, I would say, now an influencer, right? Very much cause-based, and every one of our brands has a very unique DNA that um, hold, upholds these values. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, what consumers show and care about the most, especially Gen Z. And yet, going back to Gen Z, is there any sort of consumer research you can speak to in general about what's, what is, you mentioned authenticity, what else is really important to this class of consumers? Well, exactly what we talked about, having that fit and, and having that um, satisfaction. So when you look at products um, like virtual reality and, mm -hmm. and try on products, those are very important to them. Being able to see the product on them right now, um, especially when you're in a digital world. You know, we heard a lot about the pop-ups and the experiences in store. I think that's mm -hmm. really important to them as well. Mm -hmm. um, but in that instant gratification that beauty provides, that instant being able to see this, this color on you mm -hmm. right now, that's critical and understanding their benefit and being able to have multiple sources of information to make their decision is critical as well. Okay. And, and going back to some Instagram shopping tools, I know um, you've been working on some new tools like Countdown Timers and Checkout within the app. Can you provide some color on how these tools are fueling sales of beauty products? And um, can you share any metrics around the success of these tools in converting browsers to buyers? Yeah, so shopping has um, been in existence since early 2017. And we start off with the product tags and posts and videos. And today, um, about the latest figure released is 130 million people are interacting actively with those shopping posts. So 130 million people are using shopping holistically. And then in the last year, we launched the ability for people to buy within the app um, without having to open up a browser. Um, and that was launched early last spring within a small beta. And so it's still early days, but what we have seen um, and, we're, and we want to go slow because we want to get it right because trust is of utmost importance. And, um, 
I think the thing that's been really interesting to see, and this is very much true in the beauty community, we saw after launching Checkout that we started to see really organic um, utilization of the Checkout feature for both brands and, and shoppers of um, product launches. So Instagram is a very real-time place. It's a great place to come announce a new product. People, shoppers in turn, look to Instagram as a place to hear from their brands what's the latest. And so, again, leaning into the behavior that we see and supporting people what they're trying to do, on top of checkout, we launched the product launch feature, which is the ability for a brand to basically post a sticker in their story that says, I have a launch coming up, really give them the excuse to give that authentic direction, like, hey, I have a product, this is why you should be excited about it. So really, I think, encapsulate a lot of the best practices, and people can subscribe for notification and then not miss out on their favorite drops. And that's been working really well, especially in conjunction with a feature that we launched called Shopping from Creators, which basically allows um, brands like Mac to really um, take the products that they're working with with their creator community and help the creators amplify those products to their own communities as well. Great, and Salima, I'd love to hear from you as well on how you're seeing customers engage with these tools. For sure. Um, so, so Mac launched in, in the beta with Instagram. We were very excited for it. Um, it. It's been an evolution, right? So we've been testing different distributed commerce type of plays, um, and this one felt like a great fit for us. We were very excited to be invited and, and participate. Um, what we're seeing is, um, and, it, and it's still early, and we're excited to see it scale. What we have seen is 70% of the customers that we've received are new to the brand. So that is, is amazing when you think about the impact that social has um, and this community has and Instagram has uh, on, on a brand like Mac who's been around forever and has one of the largest D2C footprints. Um, so that was an incredible kind of early result. Are the 70% that are new, are those people who have checked out, have used the, those yes. tools? Okay. Yes, to check out. Um, and what Instagram. does that tell you about those customers that maybe they would have never shopped before because of their, the friction of having to go to another page to check out? Perhaps, or mm -hmm. it also tells me that um, that's where a consumer is. Mm -hmm. And the way that, and what they're willing to do and their behavior is something very different than what we used to do, mm -hmm. right? I look at my own behavior and, and um, I've gone through the multiple click checkout. Mm -hmm. I, I actually bought something from Lively, so that's a little, um, <laughs> you know, on the power of social. Um, but I also am a huge fan, especially when, when um, Instagram launched this, of Zara. So I get a lot of like first exclusive access things um, and so it's really exciting to be able to say to your consumer, or different types of consumers, it's a completely different way to talk to them and to interact with them and also understand how do you meet them where they are. And it is frictionless um, and it is easier, um, but it also is very visual in a very different way. And it's kind of in intuitive for them mm -hmm. because they're already spending so much time. So you're not taking them away from what they're doing and how they're doing it. And as I mentioned earlier, we're increasingly turning to influencers to inform our buying decisions. Do either of you worry about influencer exhaustion? Are customers going to start feeling or are they already feeling like they're being spammed by the people that they're following, telling them to, to buy things that they are maybe getting a fee from, um, from promoting? Um, do you worry about a loss of trust in influencers due to the money that some of them are making? Is this a conversation you're having at Estee Lauder? We, we have talked about it and we've talked about it more from a paid perspective. But when we go back to kind of how Estee Lauder, Estee herself founded the, org, uh, the company, it was a very word of mouth company, right? Telegraph, telephone, telefriend. That's one of her famous quotes that we talk about a lot. <laughs> um, and, and that principle, as long as your products are loved, is what she believed that people will talk about it. Mm -hmm. So how people talk about it, how digitally people talk about it, the influencer and the rise of influencers, we always believe that that is going to be paramount and critical um, mix. Um, so one way or another, um, consumers are going to rely on that, they're going to look for it, but they're going to be able to tell if it's authentic. Okay. Um, and that's what's most important. Can we tell our story authentically? So that's the key to avoiding this influencer exhaustion is maintaining authenticity. Absolutely. Okay. And, and Layla, is this a conversation you're having at Instagram? Yeah, I think influencers have always been around. Like your first influencer is probably your mom and, and the people you're living with in your home. And now people just have more ability to share and evangelize the products and brands that they love, and Instagram has really become a place for that. Mm -hmm. So influence will definitely not go away, but I think what, what Mac does like very well is it's like who has influence will, will expand, and I think who people will want to look to will change as well. And so for example, like 
I'm Persian and I follow um, a Persian influencer who's like under 50K followers, but I follow her because we have the same skin tone, eye color, hair color. So if she were to find a red lipstick, I'm just gonna get that one instead of weeding through all the options. So with, with options increasing, I think people actually need curation more, but who they will look to is people that look like them or and, and can create that personal and personalized experience through influence as well. And I'd love to talk about the future. What can we expect in 2020 and beyond in terms of beauty trends or um, social commerce tools? Um, I'd love to hear from both of you on this. Sure. Um, at least from our perspective, what we're seeing more a, as a trend than ever before is this um, this thirst for knowledge. We're seeing consumers search in ways that they haven't searched before coming to our sites and in search of um, very long stream, like how to do this, how to do that, um, very organically. Um, and, and it's lending itself well to even Instagram and how they, they shop on Instagram. So while Instagram checkout is now a big part of our mix and we have a long runway of many brands that are um, are slated to launch. We're excited to see how different categories also do with that, um, whether it be skincare or hair care. Um, but we believe that it, it is about the how-to. It's about the teaching moment. It is about that. Um, you know, now that I have this product or I want this product, how do I how do I get full utility out of it? So and how do you meet those no, those those needs? Uh, is it through videos? And I, I'm assuming through many pl different types of yeah. uh, of different platforms. And I think there is m multiple ways, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about it through videos and how to and content, a lot mm -hmm. of content, um, but also through community. Okay. Um, and to Layla's earlier point, those smaller micro communities where you know where they feed off of each other and they understand because they have a common basis mm -hmm. to to grow off of. I think that's criti critical, at least as we look forward. And yeah, I completely agree. I think that in, from a product perspective, um, I think we've seen a lot of investment in discovery of products, and people for sure now look to Instagram and other platforms to discover the product. But I think increasingly the community will expect the opportunity to consider the product more deeply within these platforms. And so I definitely see um, more conversational tools that are more video based, more immersive, AR, uh, live conversations with your community and talking about the product. And then also more tools to help the community talk about the product amongst themselves um, and evangelize that product. So I definitely see um, the next wave of product and activity around social commerce being in that consideration phase. Great, and uh, one, I think we have time for one more question. I, I want to know, um, and either of you can, can speak to this, are we in a skincare bubble? Sales of skincare products have, the, and these are, these are items like lotions and serums, they've been booming in the US while cosmetic sales growth, traditional cosmetics has been slowing. What is driving this trend? Is social media playing a part? And is it possible that we've reached peak skincare? Uh, you know, as we have a portfolio of brands, so we like to play that portfolio against skincare, makeup, uh, hair care, whatever's trending now. So mm -hmm. we like to be wherever the consumer is and whatever she needs. Um, while we've, we've heard the same trends and seen the same trends specifically in North America, what we're, also, what we're really seeing in social, especially with, our, with our, the pilot with MAC, mm -hmm. is that it's still a, a color moment. 80% of the, of the sales came in color, lips, eyes, palettes. So the consumer is still craving um, those items. Um, for sure, there's a natural trend that is going on that is very much um, plays into the skincare, and there's a, this trend to be more natural and health, healthy, healthy skin, mm -hmm. dewy skin. Um, but those trends will always be there, and, and the rise and fall, and, and for us, at least from a portfolio of brands, we, you know, we love it all. Great. Did you have anything to add to that? She's definitely the expert on <laughs> yeah. um, beauty product trends, but yeah. I think in general, what we just see on Instagram is that people are continuously looking for ways to um, express themselves. Um, it's a very expressive place, and so we certainly see both the most colorful um, and vibrant makeup as well as that, that dewy look, and so both are very much present. All right, thank you so much. Now I'd like to open it up to you guys for questions. Question is for Layla. Um, we heard from Jeff earlier and from, from you at the beginning of the presentation that um, this is still an emerging tool and Instagram is still evolving this capability. What are you doing to educate consumers on your platform? Instagram has a, obviously a huge uh, network um, on this capability and to start to get consumers buying more through Instagram checkout. Yeah, I think that's a really good question um, because unlike you know Facebook, our parent company and 
Facebook app where payments have been a big part through donations and that Marketplace tab for some time. This is really the first time that people are taking out their credit cards and actually buying something within the app. So it is a new behavior. Um, and we've seen two things work really well. Well, first of all, when someone does make their first purchase, they're just really delighted and they're excited to do it again and find products that are as convenient. So that's like, that is really encouraging. The question is, how do you help them find that first product that is like super compelling? Um, how do you really educate on like, what is that post-purchase experience? Because we want to make sure when someone buys something on Instagram, they don't say, I bought it from Instagram. They say, I bought it from XYZ brand um, through Instagram. And that relationship is really critical to maintain. That's why we tell people we're trying to build a personalized mall where you leave the mall having bought from Mac. Right. Um, so what we've seen work really well is for the brand themselves to actually educate on how to check out. Um, and so there are tutorial videos that we've seen brands launch with. You know, we, uh, there's one brand that we work with, Chinatown Market, that did a really funny meme-like tutorial on how to actually check out. And that was something that they did before their first drop, so people already go. Um, when we learned, when we saw them do that, we actually built that educational component into our drops feature so that we help you set up your credentials before the drop happens so you realize that you need to put your information in to get the product. So there's things like that that we're doing, um, baking into the features, but also working with the brands to educate their own communities on how to do this. And we have time for one more question. My question is for Salima, and I'm wondering what are the specific metrics that you use to track customer acquisition and then how do you get a customer to repeat and what are the symbols that you see from acquisition to retention? Yeah. Um, so first it's important to, to, to um, kind of give you some background. Estee Lauder launched its first brand site um, 20 years ago. So our, our brand site business, our e-commerce channel is, is massive, it's grown, it's at scale. So when we look at acquisition and when I said that 70% new, that is, that is a real big KPI for us because that is a very different way um, of seeing a new consumer. So for us, acquisition is really about um, that sale, but it also can be lead gen for acquisition and getting that email address um, to be able to communicate. Um, we're consent based, so acquisition really comes with the consent. For us, that is critical for how we communicate with consumers. Um, and because we're in an ecosystem that is much larger than our brand site, um, we have retail, wholesale is a large, large channel. We have our direct to consumer and our freestanding stores. For us, it's, it's critical to look at retention, not only just by one channel, but across channels, right? So our, um, we don't care where the consumer shops. We're really about being customer first. Um, and our answer to, to, to having retention is about loyalty, right? And so a lot of our, our, our brands have invested in loyalty programs um, that allow the consumers to shop in whatever channel they want and how they want to interact with us because what's most important is that we retain the consumer and we give them the best experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please welcome Anushka Salinas, COO, Rent the Runway, and Katie Thompson, Deputy Executive Editor, Business Insider. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, I'm so excited to speak with you. Um, for those of you who don't know about Rent the Runway, and if you're not already a subscriber, it is a fashion subscription service where you can basically exchange uh, four pieces of items as many times as you like. I should start by saying that I am an avid user, um, what you'd probably call a power user, actually going there after this. Um, so very familiar with the product, but if you would have told me 10 years ago that I would be renting my clothes uh, and that the majority of the clothes that I wear, it feels like now, are not mine and that they are in fact rented, I would not have believed you. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm excited to speak with you because I want to talk to you not only about sustainability and how it relates to the environment, but also about the sustainability of your business model and how you guys are doing it. Um, I mentioned this at the top, but there are so many stores that are going out of business. And there's this you know, retail apocalypse trend that we keep hearing about. It's really dark times for a lot of traditional retailers. So I would love to get your input on what you think is 
driving this consumer shift because even though we're seeing traditional retailers go out of business, we're seeing a growth in things like the sharing economy and in the rental market. So what is behind that? What is the one thing driving it? Yeah, so I think the at its core, what used to be a pride of ownership has really changed to the pride of access. So you know, we've seen over the last 10 years, as you say, the rise of the sharing economy, a term that 10 years ago didn't even really exist. And that's happened across multiple industries. So in transportation, we're all very familiar with Uber and Lyft. In travel, Airbnb. In content and music, Spotify and Netflix, among others. And so this has really come to light over the last 10 years as these industries have transitioned. And I think it's really reinforced for consumers that you don't need to own, in fact, you shouldn't own all of these things. And, and there's much more of this pride in being able to access um, these experiences or products versus needing to sort of be burdened with the ownership. And I think that's what it's become. People feel burdened by ownership. Um, I'd say for Rent the Runway, the cultural movement of you know, social media and you know, Facebook around the time that we launched, it really catapulted our business and brought to light that um, you know, you could experience a, a totally different way of getting dressed and not need to actually purchase all these things. And we've seen that come to light in our subscription in a very real way. 89% um, of our subscribers, the program you are a member of and described, um, report fundamentally shopping less. So I think that really highlights this shift from ownership into access. And this shift that um, you know, we have also helped support where women don't feel the need to, to own all of these things anymore. Yeah, um, so ownership though in and of itself, do you think it's dying? Is that going away for good or will there always be people who are looking to own something themselves? Listen, 78% of millennials report preferring to spend their money on experiences over physical goods. So is it going away? Probably not, but there's a major shift away from needing to own things and I think you know, if you look at your closet, it's sort of a museum of the past, right? The majority of items in a woman's closet are worn two times or less. And, and I think women in particular are way smarter about wanting to both present their best self and have incredible variety, because oftentimes those photos are posted on Facebook, um, but do so in a more sustainable, smart way and use the additional dollars for a great experience. Yeah, and you touched on this. How much of the desire to be more sustainable is driving it? Is it a primary force or is it just an added benefit? Well, sustainability is inherently part of the business model that we pioneered 10 years ago. Um, you know, we are one of the only companies out there that's telling you, telling our consumers, buy less stuff, right, versus consume more. Um, and so that has always been at the core of what we do. I think we launched as a special occasion business where it was a few use cases a few times a year and, and where we are today is our most engaged subscribers are experiencing and wearing Rent the Runway 120 days a year or more. Mm -hmm. So you know, being able to leverage um, borrowing versus owning is driving a much more sustainable outcomes. Um, you know, there's a crazy stat that 20% of what the global fashion industry produces every year, that's a $2.4 trillion industry, gets thrown away every year. So by, by shifting behavior into more rental and higher utilization of those products, um, we're driving much more sustainable outcomes. Yeah. You guys talk a lot about the closet in the cloud yes. um, and a living closet. So you've been ahead of this curve, right, of seeing that you can bring something into the cloud in that regard. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on what are some other things that we never thought we would rent previously that we may be renting in five years? Yeah, so you know, expansion of our assortment has been a key part of our strategy. And that has all been led by our consumers. So when we launched subscription, we never would have dreamed that denim and sunglasses would be two of our best categories. We always sort of assumed that those would be items that you should just purchase, right? You wear your sunglasses like, what, half of the year? Mm -hmm. You wear your jeans all the time? Those would make sense. I think we have been humbled by the feedback and performance of our business in areas that we never imagined. And that's why you've seen innovation from us in expanding the categories that we offer. So in the last 8 to 12 months, we launched 
kids wear, which if you haven't been on our site, it's some of the most adorable stuff you'll ever see. Little girls' dresses from Stella McCartney and Fendi. Talk about things you should definitely never purchase because she's going to outgrow <laughs> that in like a week. Um, and then all the way to home products from West Elm. Um, and then driving more convenience for travel by a partnership with W Hotels. So you know the assortment is going to continue to grow, and that's really in response to our consumers like you saying, I don't want to buy this stuff. Anything that I don't want to buy, I would prefer to experience through Rent the Runway as part of my membership. So you'll continue to see those innovations from us, which will be really driven based on what our consumer is wanting from us. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that and pushing into new product categories, you guys um, have very ambitious plans. Last year, you became a unicorn valued at a billion dollars. Um, and looking forward, your CEO has said that you guys want to be a hundred billion dollar company. Um, she's also said that you want to be the Amazon Prime of re rental. Um, this will mean expansion into new categories, no doubt. So as you look ahead, at not only into categories, but geographically expanding, what are your plans and expansion to new markets? Yeah, so I think certainly, you know, we started as the closet in the cloud. I think we think about the evolution as the life in the cloud. So any category of products that you would want to rent from us is something that is on our radar for the future. And again, we'll be very led by what our customers are telling us they want most. Um, geographic expansion is certainly on the horizon for us. Um, you know, we, we will go international. We don't have a tight timeline on that yet, but we will. So in 2020, will you be leaving the U.S.? Can you share? Not now? in 2020. Okay. Um, and speaking of growth... It's 2020 now, right? Yes. Oh, my okay. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> just checking. Snuck up on us. Um, but also, just speaking of growing, you know, you guys had a really big year in 2019. Uh, there were some growing pains in October where you guys were switching over to a new software system. You had a pause period where you couldn't accept new customers. So I'm curious to learn what you guys, what the biggest lesson was from that experience and how you are sort of looking ahead and planning on delivering you know, customer experience as you continue to grow. Yeah, I'm glad you asked because you know, we are disrupting a core behavior that women have been doing for hundreds of thousands forever, right? Getting dressed, acquiring clothing that you have to hold on to and wear for some period of time. And we have fundamentally disrupted a very core human behavior. And it's only been 10 years, which sounds like a long time, but is also not that long to build a company like ours. And so we are honest with ourselves that when you're a disruptor, as, as um, like us, and, and disrupting something so big and important and ingrained in the culture of society, you, you, you're not gonna get it right 100% of the time. And so we're honest that it's, it, you can't promise perfection if you're disrupting at the, at the level that we are. So what we do is um, we are really honest with ourselves and with our customers. We think transparency is super important. If we're gonna get it wrong, which we have in the past, um, we always wanna make sure that we're doing right by our customers. And sometimes that just means telling them exactly what's going on. And sometimes that means over-communicating. Um, and that's, that's really a core part of who we are as a business and have been for 10 years, and that also happens to be what consumers are demanding today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, radical transparency across um, everything that's happening in the business. So um, that's, that's who we are, and we will continue to push innovation and driving the customer experience, which means we won't get it right 100% of the time. Also, sort of in the same vein of expansion, you guys have some very interesting models that you've adopted. Um, you are working with designers, you're co-manufacturing, you're doing revenue sharing. I'm, I'm curious, like how, it's kind of like the Netflix model, it feels like to me. You know, they're, they're con the designers are the content creators now, right? Yeah. How is this partnership beneficial for both parties? Um, it's very beneficial for both parties. So since the beginning of the business, we are one of the companies out there that has always and only partnered directly with brands. We have never, um, gone out and tried to acquire inventory unless we had express um, you know, partnership with those brands. So that's been really important to us. And as we've seen what's been happening in the landscape around retail, um, this has been really challenging for brands, right? Distribution is drying up for them, um, and they're having a harder and harder time 
um, kind of keeping pace with that as retail has, has struggled with that. So we came up with the idea for our designer collective uh, about two years ago, I think it was, and we really wanted to create a model whereby designers could do what they do best, which is design products, you know, bring back the authenticity and creativity in the design process. And we wanted to help them be competitive with a fast fashion or some of the lower price things that are happening out there. And so we partner with them very closely. They do the thing that they do best, which is design amazing, beautiful, high quality clothing. And we produce that at a similar level of quality, but at a lower price. And so it's really mutually beneficial. And we share in, in the positive outcomes of that with the designers. Yeah, and one thing I find interesting is you also share data. We do. And that, to me, is appealing because you can give them all kinds of feedback, feedback on how long a garment lasts. And, and how does that play into, you know, potentially the manufacturing of the garments? Uh, and I'm glad you asked that. It plays a huge part. So data has been a part of our business from the very beginning. We have millions of anonymized data points that we use to both improve our customer experience, drive personalization on our website so you can find products that you love that fit you. Um, but perhaps more importantly, that data gets to provide a feedback loop to designers, to all of our designer partners, where we, we help guide is the um, product holding up to the process of cleaning? Is it fitting customers? If not, where might it not fit and how can they improve that fit over time? Um, so that feedback loop has been really important. I think, you know, as it relates to Designer Collective, for us it's really, it's not just a data-driven design, it is the creativity and authenticity of those creators combined with the power of our data to make a better product. Mm -hmm. And we feel that that is really, really important because at the end of the day, customers want the heart and feel of what a, a creator is gonna make in a garment versus what an algorithm is gonna make. Mm -hmm. And by making a better product, it lasts longer. Correct. Therefore, becomes more sustainable because it can be used more, I'm assuming. Absolutely. It takes 800 gallons of water to create just like a basic cotton dress. Mm -hmm. So every, by us using our data to deliver better outcomes in terms of inventory performance and desirability, and quality of garment so it holds up, that's less products that need to be created. Um, and we're able to drive higher utilization of the same item. That's inherently more sustainable than, um, say, fast fashion, where it's where one or two times it falls apart and you move on. That garment still took you know, 800 gallons of water to produce. Mm -hmm. um, and sustainability is also, you know, it's a very important issue for all of us, but there's the generation ahead, the next generation of consumers, Gen Z, you guys have primarily been targeting a lot of millennials. That's kind of helped build your business. How are you thinking about Gen Z and your strategy there, and what changes may you have to make to you know, acquire that consumer? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting thing for us. So we spent a lot of time early on, and we still do, um, kind of explaining the value to, uh, to a millennial customer of why you should rent versus buy, right? The cultural uh, tailwinds are behind us, but it's still a journey every day to explain why you should just not buy anything anymore. Um, that said, Gen Z grew up with this. You know, they grew up being able to call a, a car at, at four moments, you know, four minutes notice on their smartphone. They grew up with same day delivery. They grew up with social media, you know, from the time they were children. So in a lot of ways, it's easier to talk to this customer because they don't want to own stuff. Mm -hmm. right they at all <laughs> they're used to that they they totally buy into access over ownership um, so the hurdle to climb with that generation is um, there's more of a desire for um, for being unique mm -hmm. in the products that you wear and expressing yourself as authentically as possible so we've had to really think about the designer matrix that we carry and the product assortment mm -hmm. which we have done and a lot of that has been listening to our brand ambassadors so we have a big campus program which we actually have had for the last eight or nine years where we have campus reps um, that partner with us and we get great feedback from them and they bring the message of Rent the Runway to their campuses so it helps seed the future generation of renters. Mm -hmm. And your business, it naturally lends itself to the sustainable model, but there obviously no business is perfect and you know all the garments that we receive come wrapped in plastic. There is you know, the, the transportation of the garments and the emissions that that create 
I'm, I'm curious to just get you to weigh in on, you know, where do you guys see the need for improvement and what are you doing to move towards that? Yeah, I think the business model is inherently far more sustainable than, than purchasing, but that's not good enough, obviously. You know, we have a number of intentional strategies to drive sustainability that we have done. So some that you would have seen is, um, you know, we used to ship in cardboard like every other company. Um, we now ship in a patented um, reusable garment bag that gets um, used both ways. And that has been really positively received um, by consumers. They love that and we've been able to defray um, a lot of waste from landfills as a result of that. We also do um, some really interesting recycling initiatives for any of the packaging that comes inside that reusable garment bag. Um, and this is real recycling, not the fake kind that sometimes you feel like is happening. Um, we take all of that post-consumer plastic waste and we recycle it with a company called Trex. Um, and that's, they take that locally and they turn that into wood alternative decking and railings that endures for many, many um, years to come. So we take this really seriously. You'll see more from us in, over the course of the next 12 to 18 months as it relates to intentional sustainability. Um, so stay tuned. Mm. Um, and obviously, sustainability is about more than just the environment. That is a big focus of it. But it also includes you know, worker diversity, um, workers' health and safety. I know that in 2018, Rent the Runway, they took hourly employees and offered them the same benefits of salaried employees. So what are you guys doing in the same vein as you look at that part of being sustainable? It's a huge focus for us. We deeply care about every single employee of the company, and I think, as you mentioned, you see that from the policies that we have taken, and those are not inexpensive things to do, to give um, corporate-style benefits to every single person that works in um, our retail stores and, and to warehouses is, is a pretty expensive thing to do. But it's important to us as a business, and turns out it's actually pretty important to consumers as well. 72% mm -hmm. um, of Gen Z says that they're actually willing to pay more for a product if they know that that business is inherently um, more socially conscious and environmentally sustainable. So actually, um, we're on the right side of that, and we mm -hmm. feel good about that. But you'll see, um, you'll certainly see more and more from us as it relates to ensuring that we're caring for our workers, that their health and safety is cared for. Mm -hmm. We have time for probably one more question, um, and before we open it up to Q and A, I want to know what for 2020. What is Rent the Runway's biggest goal? Like, what is the one thing that you guys are working to achieve? Um, it's definitely not one thing, but I will say um, we are under the covers, we're a technology and logistics company that sort of fronts as a fashion company. Um, and 2020 is all about building the customer experience. And what that means is actually the stuff, you know, the elbow grease, the things behind the covers that it takes to deliver an incredible customer experience. And so it's not quite as sexy, but it's what is required to really deliver on um, the access that we know that our consumers want and, um, and making sure that we can do that um, over time. Mm -hmm. I want to open it up to you guys. Do you have any additional questions? Sure. Hi. Thank you. I loved uh, listening to you. I have a question about the sustainability part on the, you know, obviously as your revenue grows, I'm assuming that your SKUs are growing and I know that you, you know, rent each piece 50 times. Or what are your sustainability initiatives around the actual garments? So we really think about the full life cycle of a garment. Um, so renting a garment is one piece of a garment's life cycle. And then we really work to ensure that the end of life of that garment is, it, it, we, we think a lot about as well. So we liquidate merchandise in a number of different ways. Some is via um, charity partnerships that we have where that garment gets a new life with somebody else. Um, some is via clearing that merchandise. Um, to customers that you know loved experiencing it and want to own it. So we really do think about the full life cycle of a garment and ensure that we are not contributing to, to putting clothing in landfills. Feedback, but I was a subscriber and I let it lapse only because of the plastic. So I'm just so happy to hear you say that you're meaningfully recycling it. So thank you very much. Yes, please please send it all back. And even if you have dry cleaning bags that are not recyclable via traditional means, you can tuck those in your, um, in your Rent the Runway bags and we will send those as well. Thank you so much, that's great. Yeah. Any other questions? 
I have one more question. Um, as you look ahead, I know you're, you're considering different product categories, but, and right now women is your target audience and you're also providing children's clothing, but what about the likelihood of getting into menswear? Is that something you guys are looking at at all? Yeah, it's interesting. The New York Times wrote an article about a week and a half ago talking about um, rental in the men's category. Um, it's not off the table in the future, but there's so much more that we can do um, in, the, in the closet of a woman and in the home of a woman um, that are really exciting to us. Mm -hmm. So, not yet. And um, along the lines of sustainability, what is, when you look at your partnerships with, I know obviously when you're working with the designers, you guys are taking in to how that fabric is made, right. but what about the designers that are on your platform? Like, how much insight do you guys have into their sustainability practices? Yeah, we talk a lot to our designer partners about this, and obviously we have 650 designer partners, so we can't control absolutely everything that each of them does, but it's very important in our conversations with them, and, and certainly for any clothing that we produce, we are very conscious of this. So you're actually going to see later this spring um, a brand launch from us in partnership with, um, with uh, a great influencer um, that is all based on recycled materials. So it's very, very much at the forefront of what we're doing. Cool. One more question over here. First of all, incredible company. My wife uses you all the time, and I don't think you should waste your time with men. I think we're a bad <laughs> customer for you. Um, just speaking as a heterosexual but very fashion-forward kind of guy, I think you're wasting your time. But anyway, my question is, what do you wish you could do that you can't, that like keeps you up, like keeps your meetings going longer than you want them to, that you're like, I wish we could do this and figure this out? I mean, for us, it's all about, we have 90% of our subscribers work. So we think a lot about how do we drive hyper convenience, right? Not just convenience, but hyper convenience. And all of that is in a backdrop of Amazon raising the bar every single day of convenience. And I'm totally a victim of this. I'm like, oh my god, I have to wait two hours, you know? So what do I wish I could snap my fingers and do? I wish I could snap my fingers and be able to deliver at the level that Amazon can. But we are, we are working on it, so. Uh, and that's all the time we have, guys. And I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. That's much. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if you wouldn't mind, there is a card in the notebook that was on your chair. Please give us feedback and join us for networking um, after this. Thank you.